So I guess it's the right time to start this uh, second day of the uh, European Persona User Workshop. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, connected today. Um, yesterday we had uh, 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 a f well uh, a full afternoon uh, filled with uh, presentations, different types of presentations, um, mostly from the user point of view of how how Persona is used uh, and uh, in, in different ways. We'll continue a bit today with the same kind of presentation and then we'll uh, slowly move to uh, the internals of Persona, how, how, how Persona is being developed and the new features that you can expect in the next uh, Persona 5.0 uh, version. So today we have again three different sessions of um, of a few a few presentations. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the PMP, the Performance Management Platform. We'll talk about the lookup service. We'll talk about Persona 5.0. We'll talk about uh, future developments. You can see the agenda as uh, as it shows on displays on your on your screen at the moment, uh, and um, and we'll have yeah a short a short break between uh, between each each session uh, and uh, some time to answer our questions. Um, so don't hesitate to ask to ask questions during the presentations in the, the Zoom chat. Uh, and uh, the presenter uh, or the people will try to answer during the presentation or just right after or at the end of the session, like, like we did uh, yesterday. And uh, let's kick off this right away with uh, Shimon, who is going to uh, present us the latest uh, development in the PMP um, service. Yeah, can you see the slides? Yes, that's good. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Szymon Trocha of Poznań Supercomputing and Networking Center in Poland. And um, in uh, the project, I'm responsible for the uh, PMP service. And as Antoine said, um, I will give an overview, uh, but um, I will also try to, as this session looks like the perfect place for that, uh, to give you uh, some practical experiences and examples of how the infrastructure can be used and uh, can be uh, also uh, managed uh, when you build a personal uh, infrastructure in your own domain uh, and also how you can make use of uh, the instances and make use of the data and I think this topic will also be followed in a few uh, next presentations. So uh, first of all, uh, PMP, as it stands for the Performance Measurement Platform, is the proper Jean service. Uh, in fact, if you look at the personal related services in, in Jant, you will find a few of them. PMP is one of them, uh, uh, but you also have the uh, personal development as part of the international project. Uh, we also have the personal consultancy. Uh, where we help the users to deploy Persona, uh, to um, uh, train them uh, how to make use of the infrastructure and the data. Uh, and we also work in the international community to support all the personal um, users. Um, so what PMP is about? 
it basically started somewhere in uh, 2016. Uh, for those who don't know, I see a couple of new faces uh, as uh, participants of today's workshop. So I uh, will try to spend just a uh, moment on that. Um, um, it was a, like a natural evolution of the small notes project. Uh, if we say small, uh, that means we were trying to build a monitoring and measurement infrastructure or a platform currently, which consists of the low cost hardware. That means mini PCs with a cost of roughly 200 euros. Uh, so not expensive, but also not big in size so that you can easily uh, afford for buying that. And you can also easily fit into your um, uh, let's say racks or even put it under your under your desk. So it's it's useful, it's easy to move, uh, but it still provides the full functionality personnel gives you. But uh, the nodes are of course spread over the participants of the giant project and a little bit beyond. Uh, and that's the measurement points, let's say. Uh, but the important piece of the service are the central components, which are managed by us, by the operation team. Uh, and they allow us and provide the platform to, um, to gather the measurement data, to store them and to present. And of course, they provide additional functionalities to manage all the infrastructure we have so that it's operated in an easy way in such a distributed environment. So everything is, is uh, operated and maintained by the uh, team where we have uh, most of the team here today in the workshop. And uh, it wouldn't be uh, uh, the full measurement platform without an ability to run regular testing to some other personal instances. So what we did, uh, we uh, set up our own, inf own infrastructure of the uh, low cost hardware nodes but we also run a regular tests towards some other personal instances, namely a selected uh, measurement points within the Jean network, which are operated uh, by Jean. So we created kind of the partial mesh uh, for the NRNs to observe the data and uh, see how the uh, performance behaves. So if we, um, look at the current coverage of the service. Um, we cover all of the Jant partners and uh, which is not shown on this on this picture in fact, but you can easily look at the lookup service directory. Uh, we are a little beyond uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa with a few countries with a few countries there. So we can we can say that we are, having at least one instance in every Jean partner. So it's an infrastructure ready to use, um, available both for the NRNs, the hosting organizations, which have a little bit, let's say more privileges than the other, uh, but also for anyone, uh, including Jean, who wants to um, use the personal infrastructure which is deployed there. Uh, we are not, let's say, much different from any other meshes, probably, apart from a few types of tests. Uh, but we constantly run uh, at least the basic measurements like uh, throughput every six hours, uh, continuous latency tests, uh, packet loss, and round trip time. Uh, of course, we are looking from the perspective of IPv4 and IPv6. Um, I will talk about IPv6 later on, but uh, it's not, I think I said that in one of the workshops um, a year ago or two, uh, that it's still not that popular and not, you don't see that many deployments of IPv6 uh, for some reason, uh, but we would like at least to see where possible and run those two types of measurements. What is a little bit different from the other meshes probably, and we were since the very beginning of this functionality in, in personal when it was released, a uh, very first uh, user of that. We run uh, regular tests with two types of new 
uh, test, namely the HTTP request time, where you can in fact query uh, the, uh, the, the web server uh, and observe whether it's uh, available, whether it serves your request and uh, get the HTTP request time. And the second one uh, was about the DNS query time, uh, so that you query the DNS uh, server to get answers and to see if it's reachable. But what I wanted to focus today a bit uh, is to show you how to properly operate such an infrastructure. And I think we are uh, giving here a good example of, of such operation, which is probably very useful for those who operate just more than a few nodes probably, so that it's easy and safe to operate such a big infrastructure. We have more than 40 nodes. Uh, distributed all over the world, so we needed to find a way to properly operate that. So there are a couple of central components where, as I said, uh, store the data, where the data is stored, where the visualization is placed with uh, all the measurement archive and the dashboard. Uh, the dashboard is publicly available. Uh, of course, the hosts as the measurement instances of personal are also publicly available. You can easily reach every instance of PMP with your own instance of, instance of personal and you can easily run the test towards these instances. Um, in order to make all the configuration easy and quick, we use extensively Ansible automations uh, so that every, for instance, change in configuration, adding a new user, uh, onboarding uh, a new instance of PMP uh, host to the mesh. Uh, all this is done through Ansible scripts and uh, that speeds up and make all the life of the operations team uh, much more easier. Um, the operation team uses uh, and infrastructure monitoring extensively uh, so that we know how the whole infrastructure behaves and how the nodes, nodes behave. Um, and based on that, uh, we of course maintain all the center parts. We react to the monitoring, to alarms, observe the trends and support our users in deployment uh, and of course take part in the dissemination um, activities. So let's uh, let's have a look at the central instances of, of monitoring the, the monitoring, let's say. Um, basically, we have two uh, pieces we would like to know about. The first one is the central instance where Medesh is. Uh, and we measure different key metrics there. This is mainly used for uh, KPI reporting in the project, but we also want to detect situations when uh, some component is unhealthy or a threshold is exceeded. So for instance, if the user interface is unresponsive because of some issue on the uh, virtual infrastructure where the server is, or uh, for instance, we would like to be alerted when uh, the available disk space is exceeded, for instance, because we store all the data there and we want to know that. So we, we, we use Grafana for that. I will um, show you in, in a second. Uh, so that's for the central instance where, um, where everything is hosted. And we also monitor all the individual instances of uh, PMP host with multiple parameters. Um, and again, for monitoring, we make use of another Jean service, which is the network measurement as a service instance called Enmas, which provides you a kind of per user secured network infrastructure for monitoring infrastructures, which kind of, let's say, um, application shop where you can go, you can invoke the instance of the application selected for your own purposes. Uh, and in our case, it's Grafana 8 where we have all the monitoring uh, data to monitor our hosts. Um, on the hosts themselves, we use Prometheus clients, which use node exporters to export the basic um, data from the nodes to uh, the central place of Grafana, which we can easily access with Grafana's user interface to browse through all the collected data 
and for instance produce some reports just in case we want to observe the trends or the KPI is needed for the project. So for the central instance, for instance, but also for the small nodes, um, we observe basic metrics like availability so that we want to know if the host is up or down or there was any issue and we need to, for instance, uh, report that to uh, to the Jant uh, IT um, team, uh, basic numbers like memory usage, disk usage, or CPU usage. You can imagine that these things are may be important in case of small nodes, the mini PCs, which in fact have a set of limited resources. So you would like to be sure um, that uh, they are not exceeded in thresholds. Uh, that if something goes wrong, wrong with the node, you would like to first look at the numbers and see, for instance, okay, here is the uh, disk uh, limit exceeded, or you have a, a, CP, a CPU usage high, and you need to investigate that. So everything then is much more easier, and you can have all the data uh, through uh, some historical periods too. Uh, but what else we collect, and that's uh, that's a very useful set of data for those who host um, uh, some kind of personal infrastructure. We also uh, collect and visualize some basic metrics coming from uh, the tasks, the scheduler runs, etc. So, um, for instance. Uh, on this picture, you can see two numbers. The first one comes from a P scheduler, and it's the number of tasks from remote definitions. So if you have a node, you uh, consume the task definitions from some remote configuration file, and you would like to see, for instance, if that has been consumed in a proper way. You can see on the picture, there was a drop somewhere in the night uh, from the, let's say, baseline uh, for some reason that we know the baseline and we know that there should be usually 92 tasks on the node. And if, if it's different, then something goes wrong. Possibly the node didn't consume the configuration file. Um, then as regards the, uh, uh, the runs, uh, which come from the tasks, uh, you would like to know what status they are. Uh, when number of finished uh, runs, the number of failed is probably of something important for us, the number of non-starters. Non so these are the statuses of the P scheduler runs. Uh, the same, in fact, you can uh, generate through the CLI command, but here it's nicely presented. Uh, two other important metrics are regards the archiving in HTTP queue. Uh, that's something we observed particularly at some point in our notes because we had issues with archiving and we wanted to know whether all these things work properly, whether there is a log backlog of um, no, P schedule archiving or whatever and the changes in the trends, let's say. So this is important and this helps us much to assess the health of the infrastructure. Uh, so that was about monitoring and this is really helpful part for the operation of a large personal mesh. I now wanted to pay the attention to um, some functionalities available with all the infrastructure and that was based somehow on the uh, discussion we had in fact this week where people were looking for infrastructure providing an access to the NRN network and users could um, run from within the NRN environment some basic tests. So there is such infrastructure, there are PMP nodes, they are available as testing endpoints, uh, they are part of the whole personal instances and what has been shown yesterday we will even provide the on-demand user interface. So what you can do in fact with all the personal instances with the simple CLI commands, you can um, run basic tests from your own personal instance towards any other personal instance or the PMP in particular. So the users which have access to CLI, it's either the hosting organization or it's another organization which has or the personal instance can simply run the pscheduler command and within a second give a result between those uh, two hosts. So that's for instance a test here, an example 
uh, to some other PMP node. But we can also use not just the ping command, but we can use the trace route, which provides us also a little bit of more information like AS numbers, all the information from RIPE database, which is very useful while like troubleshooting the path between here, uh, I think Poznan and, and uh, Lisbon. Uh, but you could also Im imagine that you run a test towards a non-personal host. So here is the, um, a route trip type test towards some web service so that you can check the reachability of the service. And you can also run a test or uh, a third party test between two other hosts. So you're starting the command from your own personal instance, but the actual test is run between two other uh, source and destinations hosts. So you can use all the PMP instances to run that. And you can of course use the 2000 plus instances personal in the world. In order to make it easier, but probably for some of you, uh, the CLI command like those presented will be a much faster way of doing those tests than using the GUI. Uh, but again, uh, this is something which is uh, on the way and we'll should, we should have it available soon. Uh, so uh, almost finishing, uh, another interesting feature of personal we used in, in our infrastructure, which is which can probably be useful for the admins of different meshes, is the uh, uh, transform function. Uh, we had an issue where we uh, wanted to, let's say, disable the local storage on our nodes, because you can imagine that you have a personal node uh, where the uh, disk space is quite limited. And what you wanted to do is not to store the measurement results on the local nodes, but on the central server only. That's what we trying. That's what we were trying to achieve. So here is a nice example with a few short commands. The first one on the right hand side is a kind of additional tag called the reference in the PS config specification, which just adds some boolean value. Uh, to uh, uh, to make uh, to, to make the extra information within the task, and then on the right on the left hand side, uh, there is a, a part of a archiver definition which uses the transform function with a little bit of JQ script, uh, so the JSON processing script, uh, which just says the archiver to discard a run result before it is sent to the archiver plugin. So it uh, it, it, it happens at the moment of time before it's really sent to the archiver. So as you can see, it's very simple. And uh, yeah, we tested that. It, it works and enables you to uh, play with, with, uh, with all these uh, settings. Um, what we also did in the past uh, months where we added some intercontinental tests between our nodes and some major landing points in, in US, in other continents like South Africa, South America, and Asia. We're trying to do that with IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, but if you uh, probably look at the lookup service registration data, IPv6, nodes are just a fraction of all of the hosts registered in lookup service. Uh, so that means IPv6 has less coverage. So it's sometimes hard to find the same instances serving both protocols. Sometimes what I at least experienced the version six is somehow, I don't know, less maintained or whatever. So the missing uh, DNS entries for instance. So it was a bit tricky anyway, uh, we try to run at least a few measurements to major landing points of giant network um, in those continents to have at least some kind of uh, baseline people can uh, look at. And I think the final uh, slide is uh, about the future, what's ahead of us. Uh, you, will, uh, you will see a talk on, on, on 5.0. Uh, but this will be a major challenge for the infrastructure, both the nodes and the central part to migrate to 5.0 with all the changes which are introduced by, uh, by that. And uh, I think a nice introduction to this, uh, to this next talk is that we are not only operating the infrastructure, allowing users to use it, but also providing a set of data which could be analyzed by some kind of 
uh, um, artificial intelligence and all the machine learning things which uh, Lubo uh, will present. And I think that's it, um, yeah, a few minutes late. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Shimon, for this uh, presentation. Uh, is there any quick uh, question to Shimon? If there is not, I suggest we continue right away with the presentation from, from Lubo, uh, which will continue uh, to talk and discuss the, uh, the PMP uh, service and uh, with doing some data analysis of, uh, of the measurement. The floor is yours, Lubo. Uh, thank you, Anton. Thank you, Simon. Um, Simon made a nice uh, presentation about uh, PMP platform. And uh, here is some slide again, just to remind you what's uh, going on here. So we have these uh, nodes all over the Europe and a uh, couple in Africa and uh, some other parts of the world and uh, they are connected to our uh, central server where we keep the archive of all the data and uh, partial match is uh, uh, formed between the all the small nodes and uh, a couple of uh, servers that are uh, placed in the infrastructure so basically what we have if we check uh, one uh, small node uh, we have uh, measurements uh, that are being performed, two uh, measurements, of course, that are being performed between the small nodes and uh, five of these uh, uh, servers. And all of these data is uh, placed on the central platform. Uh, what measurements do we have uh, here? We will talk just about uh, measurements uh, that were interesting uh, for the data analysis, and uh, that's uh, latency. Uh, jitter rtt and throughput and of course we don't have we, have, we don't have a there is a it's not possible to have a continuous measurements of all these data so they are the measurements are performed in such a way that we have uh, for some values we have uh, let's say near real time data like uh, for latency every minute we have a histogram of uh, 600 values uh, and uh, for Jitter, of course, we have uh, every value that's based on the latency. Uh, but for uh, round trip time, uh, we have uh, five values every 10 minutes. And for throughput, we have four values a day. So uh, when we are talking about data analysis, uh, not all the data can be analyzed in, let's say, a real time. Uh, we have other measurements, uh, but uh, they were not uh, uh, considered for this uh, analysis uh, because they are uh, directed towards other servers, so like HTTP or DNS. Uh, so at the end, uh, what we have here, or at the beginning, uh, whatever you like, uh, we have a central me measurement data storage, and all the data are stored on one server, basically. So this is the perfect chance to use uh, some machine learning algorithms because uh, from one central place, we have a holistic view of the whole network performance. And uh, this is the place where we can detect stuff like, uh, I don't know, uh, imperceptible anomalies, uh, like uh, the, the link is not down, but uh, jitter is very high or the latency is high, or stuff like that. And of course, we can do various uh, different things uh, with that analysis, and we can then we can detect some kind of deterioration. And uh, if there is something going on, we can uh, we can help improve uh, root cause analysis. So the base goal was to develop some kind of machine learning model that will be able to detect such anomalies, uh, and. Uh, Actually, I've given a similar presentation a couple of months ago, so the work is going on, uh, uh, just uh, maybe a little bit slower uh, than we wanted, but it's still going on. So right now we are in some kind of uh, 
uh, let's say this uh, this orange yellow uh, area. So we have a data collection, we have a data pre-processing done, and now uh, we are dealing with choosing a model, training the model, and then evaluate it. And uh, at the end, we hope we'll have such a model deployed so we can reuse it in the real time, uh, uh, real online analysis. Uh, so uh, the end goal actually would be to have an automated pipeline. So for every link, uh, for every node, uh, node to server connection and for every direction, uh, we would need to build a registry of the models, pre-trained models uh, that can detect uh, stuff on the links. But since the uh, conditions on the link are constantly changing and uh, new values are constantly added, so the model would need to be retrained and then deployed again in some uh, automated fashion. So this is something that uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to do at the end of the project. Uh, for now, for testing, uh, we were prepared uh, in parallel while developing a P schedule a graphical user interface uh, uh, that is based on some kind of a Python proxy. And this proxy was ideal to uh, uh, implement uh, modules for uh, machine learning and uh, inference. So this is the stuff we are been working on in parallel. Uh, like uh, here we have some kind of uh, representation from the uh, result representation from the P schedule or graphical user interface, where you can see some kind of example with uh, uh, let's say some kind of normal uh, results and uh, some outliers are on the right. Uh, so in thousand packets, uh, we can see that uh, something's happened with a few hundred packets uh, uh, on the this diagram on the right, uh, where the latency jumped from uh, 30, 27 milliseconds to 77 milliseconds. So that's uh, uh, some kind of outlier. So we have a lot of data. Uh, we are talking about uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of numerical and textual data. And uh, if we want to do anything, uh, 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 if we want to use these results in the proper way, uh, we have to perform some kind of analysis. So that's uh, what I've been doing for the last uh, year or so. Uh, some kind of exploratory data analysis uh, to observe the data, to see what kind of categorization is available. Uh, are there any outliers uh, that are uh, uh, that can be easily detected? Uh, are there any missing values? Can we correlate the data? How can we visual the data, visualize the data and stuff like that? Because there is uh, such a principle uh, with uh, machine learning, if you put the garbage in, you get garbage out, so uh, you have to know what you are doing before uh, trying to implement a relevant model. So we'll be dealing with uh, some kind of procedures like uh, converting JSON file, creating data pipeline uh, you, by using Python oriented architectures, usually NumPy library, etc. Uh, at the beginning, we also knew, knew that there was no labeled data for machine learning. So we are experimenting, we are still experimenting with unsupervised learning, uh, where we put a bunch of data and try to uh, let the algorithm uh, choose what is uh, right and what is wrong. And at the end, uh, we got a lot of uh, different diagrams where we can see some uh, uh, what is going on on those links uh, that was, let's say, not uh, that could not be uh, visualized before. So here we can see some kind of uh, latency distribution on one link. So if you take a look, this is the period of two months. So all the packets. Uh, like 30 million samples that are produced in the two months period. And basically, if you check the big picture that is in upper uh, part of the screen, you can see that uh, the, this link has a latency about uh, 19 milliseconds. 
But uh, if you get in, uh, let's say deeper, you can see uh, clearly distinct spikes that are going on. So something is going on on that link. And uh, some of these spikes, like you can see this one uh, between 35 and 40 milliseconds. So a lot of packets on this link, uh, for some reason, have the latency between 35 and 40 milliseconds. And uh, this is something that can be detected uh, with the machine learning algorithm, stuff, stuff like that. So it's not that the link is broken or the packets are not going through, but uh, it's the stuff that, okay, something is going on and then we can detect this and try to correlate that with other events on uh, that link or on similar links. So for now, we were doing just the correlation on the similar links. Uh, here is some kind of the anomaly from the same measurements. Uh, if you uh, take a look here, you see that on the right, there is a minimum latency with this 30 million packet was 14 milliseconds, but there was a maximum latency with uh, 3.5 uh, seconds. So, so almost four seconds of latency. And uh, we can detect the uh, exact moment when this happens. So this is the part of these 600 measurements packets that had 466 unique values. And uh, lots of them have values between uh, one second through two second or three second. You can see on the right. Uh, actually, this is, uh, this is our uh, uh, precision. This is the most precise that we can get in because we have a, uh, let's remember that we have a latency packet, 600 packets every minute. So we cannot zoom in and see what's going on second by second. And so we can only analyze what's happened in that uh, exact minute. And uh, we analyze that uh, thing, uh, that same things on a couple of uh, other links and uh, found out that uh, lots of similar uh, stuff is going on. You can clearly see some spikes on the other links. So uh, there are some uh, deterioration in latency that are usually going on undetected. Uh, also, there are lots of, there are very lots of measurement errors detected. So you can see here in this uh, picture, in this diagram, that uh, there are packets, it's not maybe clearly seen, but uh, there are packets, uh, this uh, blue stuff on the left. Uh, so a number of packets with a delay of about one, two or three milliseconds. And that is uh, clearly impossible on the link that has a minimum delay of 14 milliseconds. So this is uh, some kind of measurement error, uh, probably because of some kind of time drift or something. So this is also one thing that uh, should be considered uh, uh, when performing such uh, measurements that uh, some kind of measurement error happens for some reasons. Uh, also interesting picture with a uh, uh, one-way delay uh, in the same endpoints, uh, two endpoints, but in different directions. So you can clearly see that uh, the conditions are similar, but not equal. If you take a look on the large number of packets. Uh, so a lot of uh, this kind of stuff uh, we were able to produce, like uh, here is uh, some kind of uh, correlation or uh, possi possible correlation. This one, this one does not have correlation. The next picture will be the graph with the correlation. So you can see in the upper picture, you can see some kind of outlier, some kind of event that that happening uh, with the delay. And we try to find out if there is any correlation with the jitter and exact time. So you can see here that uh, there were some kind of uh, you know, measurement error or, uh, or the delay, uh, but uh, there is no correlation with the jitter. But in the next picture, so this is the same uh, part of the part of the same measurement, but on the next outlier, you can clearly see on the bottom picture that there is a correlation uh, in the jitter, no, so correlation between delay and jitter in uh, this particular event. Uh, so we did a lot of uh, uh, stuff like this, and uh, we are still uh, trying to experiment with the uh, detection algorithm and machine learning models. And we hope that we'll be able to create some kind of system that can uh, automatically detect some outlier and uh, eventually correlate them uh, from with the different measurements to help to detect the problems in the network. Yeah. 
so basically that's it from me and thank you very much. Thank you, Rubo, for this interesting presentation. Uh, is there any question to Rubo or to Shimon about the PMP service? So I guess a natural. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, Tim. Oh, it's Otto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, Otto. Sorry. You're muted. You've muted yourself. I don't know if you realize if you're on a phone. There, perhaps. Better? Yeah, that's good. A bit windy. Good. All right. Now you pointed out that, I mean, if you if you put garbage into these machine learning systems, you usually get our garbage out too, and that's definitely a good point. Uh, so you need to spend quite a bit of effort probably to prepare the data set. Uh, have you sort of considered that this the effort you spend in preparing the data set is perhaps enough to uh, understand the data set and, and get analytic results out by using just some statistical methods and distributions perhaps? So, well, do you think you gain much more by throwing uh, machine learning at the end of, of the data processing pipeline? Uh, okay, so we are still experimenting with machine learning. Actually, a lot of these data were uh, produced actually using statistical uh, analysis and not machine learning analysis. So, uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> so you yeah, get yeah, quite far with just, just with that, you know. Uh, so just my point is that you, you, you do get quite far with just statistical uh, methods. So, oops, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so my, my dog came into the picture there. Uh, right, okay, that was my question. Thanks. Is there any other question, comment? I guess a natural thing from what Lubo is doing is to take steps towards being able to better alert people who are running Persona or PMP to interesting trends or real alarms, real performance changes in the system. As it stands, you can generate alerts from Persona, but you will get a lot of noise because there will be quite a lot of, um, I wouldn't say bad, bad news. there'll be quite a, quite a few alerts you get that are not real events, real changes in network properties, just through the variations that you have in the traffic. But Lubo's work is a step towards identifying real trends, real issues in the network. How do you see this work going forward from what you're doing, Lubo, into um, a tool to help people running Perfsonar to get good information about real problems rather than the sort of blips you get if you just have normal alert, uh, the existing alerting. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Well, that was a question. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, I, I dropped my headset in some uh, uh, so I didn't hear quite the question, sorry, could you? Uh, there was two parts, one was praising you for doing some good work. The other was, how do you see that work being taken forward to help people who are running Perf Sonar to better identify when there's a real issue in the network, a, a real change, a, a trend, rather than perhaps the sort of sporadic alarms that you get that aren't necessarily tied to real events? Okay, so basically, from my point of view, it, uh, it would take a lot of work, but uh, the system could be put in place uh, that would analyze the, long con lo the logs continuously. So, so you have a central archive, and uh, you could have a script that would in parallel analyze uh, stuff and uh, uh, help uh, people, let's say, filter those uh, multiple uh, alarms and uh, uh, hopefully extract only the qualified alarm, let's say, the, the, the real one that are of interest. Uh, 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 I mean, the, 
it it would take a lot of work. It would take uh, some kind of some amount of work. Uh, but uh, I think at the end uh, it will be very helpful because uh, uh, you would get proper alliance not only when the link is down or something really severe happened, but uh, also when some kind of uh, distortion in the systems happened that uh, right now goes unnoticed. Mm. And uh, maybe, I don't know, for some application, uh, let's say latency is not... Uh, uh, actually a very important thing but uh, some uh, real-time applications uh, are uh, pretty heavily uh, sensitive to latency so you would want to know if something's going on like that in the network yeah, yeah. i think i mean the, the best value to me uh, as a user with my purpose purpose on a user hat on is being able to look at what be look at what's being charted visually and see if there are any changes or trends that correspond to an ongoing performance issue that we've had reported. But having the tools to, to automate drawing your attention to that before you look, that's the, you know, the ultimate um, desirable thing. But if you map it to, for example, the security domain, if you run an intrusion detection system, you will get a lot of alerts that may or may not be genuine issues, but the real intelligence comes when you're deploying some grander system Splunk or whatever it is to do that analysis to draw your attention to what really matters and I think if we can go forward with that with persona I mean it's a really useful tool as it is but to be more proactive rather than reactive would be fantastic yeah I think so okay thank you for these questions and comments and uh, unfortunately the time is um, continuing to, <laughs> to pass. So we need to go to the next presentation, uh, which is from uh, Andriana and Katarina, and uh, are going to talk to us about the lookup service reporting. Uh, up to you. Thank you, Antoine. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi again. My name is Andriana. I'm a user services engineer uh, at uh, Serbian Academic Network. And uh, together with my colleague Katarina, I will uh, present our work within the Jean Personar team. So our task was to create some statistics of personal deployments and dashboards uh, reporting personal utilization and community characteristics using Grafana visualization tool. Uh, what you can see in the slide is current visualization tool uh, called Personal Lookup Service Directory. It consists of a map showing uh, personal deployments and uh, it contains a search interface where you can search and find all the relevant uh, information uh, regarding the deployments. Um, I would like to mention, even though you probably have heard uh, so far that the personal developers team who actually developed lookup service uh, has made some changes regarding the lookup service API and they moved to the Elasticsearch API. So they exposed the search capability of the API and now it can be easily accessed through this endpoint that you can see in the slide. And we can uh, use the rich query language of the Elasticsearch. Uh, moreover, we can easily integrate the Elasticsearch API through the Elasticsearch data source plugin uh, for Grafana. Uh, the example of this data source you can see in the picture. Uh, before we show you what we have done so far, I would like to describe uh, the information that is stored in the lookup service. So uh, whenever a personal node is installed, a lookup service collects all relevant data and uh, each registration of the node in the lookup service is saved as a record. Um, each record has its own type uh, that uh, determines the type of information that is stored in the lookup service. Um, you can see in the picture the hierarchy and the types that exist in the lookup service. Um, lookup service defines the base record and the following records of four different types. Um, 
so records of the second level are uh, grouped into two sets, network and directory, and a network set is further divided into uh, three types, service, interface, and hosts. So um, each record type uh, contains a set of uh, common fields that are inherited from the base record, as you can see in the screen. And for example, we use the field expires as the time field to import data through the data source in Grafana. On the other hand, uh, records of type service uh, inherit the uh, base record, but uh, the, uh, those uh, records add some additional fields that you can see in the picture. So we try to use some of them to extract some useful statistics regarding the persona deployment, such as number of persona services or the map with uh, service locations. Furthermore, uh, the interface record type behaves in a similar way as the previous one. So it inherits the base record and adds some additional fields. And we also use a couple of uh, fields to uh, build some interesting panels, uh, such as uh, number of personal interfaces within the deployments or interface, interface capacity of the nodes. Um, finally, so uh, the best insight into the personal community can be obtained uh, by analysis of the technical data related to hosts. And we have built most of our panels uh, using this record type. As you can see, it is the most comprehensive one. And Katarina will demonstrate how we build these dashboards and um, what is the logic behind them. Uh, last but not least, um, the directory set contains the um, uh, records of type person. Um, this record type doesn't have uh, many uh, pieces of information, so we haven't used it much. But on the other hand, uh, personal specific records extend uh, the standard records in personal, so they bring some or they add some valuable data to the standard uh, types. So to conclude the story, um, we try to make some visualization and reporting dashboards uh, for collected data in the lookup service. And together with our team, we agreed to, um, to create three different dashboards with its own purpose. Those dashboards can bring different uh, and valuable data uh, for managers and developers. And we agreed to have to create actually a personal public dashboard, which would be open for the community. Uh, we assumed that um, users and managers would be interested to have a look at some usage statistics and uh, community profile in general. While on the other hand, we also extracted some issues that potentially can be fixed in the future and that can be uh, interesting for the developers. Um, there is an idea uh, to create this public dashboard to be as usable as the lookup service directory that I show you at the beginning. Um, so uh, there is a link, it is open, but we can share it later on, of course, but it's still work in progress and probably we will change the domain when we finish uh, our work. Um, I think uh, now Katarina can demonstrate the dashboards and show you some interesting panels in detail. Um, so, hello, uh, I'm Katarina, and I am also working in Serbian Academic Network, and I am a member of Persona team, and today I will show you the way that we visualized information related to Persona community, and I am also going to explain uh, the logic that we used while we were creating these Persona dashboards. So first, I will start with um, Persona lead. 
dashboard, which is, as you can see, divided into five different sections. So the first one is uh, like general sections. And here are presented some basic information like number of persona hosts, services, and so on. Then we created some top 10 results like top 10 communities and top 10 domains. And if I go here into edit mode, you will see that, as Andriana mentioned, that we mostly used uh, information records from type hosts. And uh, then we filtered this content by uh, certain terms. And in this case, like for this panel, it's a group communities keyword. Also on my right side, you can see some like standard options for that uh, visual look of panel. So uh, here are like options for values which can be presented, um, like which uh, virtualization tool will be used, text size, colors, and so on. Uh, we also added some uh, brief descriptions so that everything is being clear. And here are presented name of persona package bundle installed, uh, version of toolkit installed, and then here access policy, uh, which is like type of privacy of hosts uh, in and it indicates who may access to hosts and run some tests. And we also here have um, record state in lookup service. Um, the second section is, is presenting maps. It's only take a couple of seconds to load. And we have here like three types of um, maps, host locations. Um, we just need to wait a little bit. I will try to reload. Okay. No. Let's try now. Maybe I could try here in this, but sorry for this. Okay, it's working. Great. So we here have a uh, three type of uh, maps. The first one is a host location. The second one is services location. And the third one is countries where registered nodes reside. So if I go and point my cursor on some location, you will see a raw data information about this location. And it's the same thing if I go here on services location. While on country map, you can see a number of um, hosts in each country, like I don't know, Norway five, Denmark also five, um, Germany 18, and so on. And if I go here into edit mode, Yes, uh, you will see that we here needed to do some transform because Grafana doesn't recognize uh, location latitude and location latitude fields. So we needed to rename them. Also in, also in countries, Yes, here in data layer option, uh, you can see how countries uh, in uh, lookup service are mapped uh, within internal uh, lookup service uh, in uh, of the maps plugin. So while we were creating these panels, um, we noticed that there are some 
uh, missing locations that are just not presented here. So we, uh, in the persona development, the devs uh, dashboard created some um, section with missing data. So be, uh, because I'm now here, uh, you can see the first five sections is the same as per Persona Lady Dashboard, and uh, these three are new. And we here presented some issues. Uh, first, we present a number of records with the same ID uh, because this client ID is supposed to be um, unique. Uh, we then uh, pulled out all the same values of this field and then we um, created these um, separate uh, panels. And uh, here we provided some detailed information about every host with uh, the same unique ID. The second section is presenting this uh, missing data that I mentioned uh, before. So uh, here we obtained all missing data uh, related to maps and uh, we displayed them here into one section. And the, this section is presenting some issues related to field values. Uh, here are like some, um, location uh, city field value uh, where uh, we uh, pulled out uh, these um, particularly values with some non-English um, letters and some suspicious uh, punctuation and here are presented records with the same host name. So now I will go back to persona uh, lead um, dashboard and we are now here. Uh, section three is presenting uh, virtualization statistics of the nodes. And uh, first we present some basic informations like number of physical and virtual machine. And then we um, created two separate panels where you can see uh, information about manufacturer for virtual and for um, physical machine. And here we used uh, value mapping uh, because format of this uh, field was, uh, this is using zero for physical machine and one for a virtual machine, which is not very user-friendly. So we rename it into something that is um, understandable. Uh, also, I would like to show you here. Yes, here we use like nine transform because first um, we had to convert roads to fields so that we could then manipulate with um, these values. And you can see, let's be here, yes. Uh, you can see that uh, Grafana sees like Dell Inc, Dell, Dell Computer Corporation, like uh, three uh, different information. So we needed to merge it and also to do uh, this kind of uh, merge to all commonly uh, used uh, manufacturers for physical machine and then to obtain all this information into one panel. We also did like similar thing with manufacturer for virtual machine and for like some other panels as well. Uh, here are presented some uh, operating uh, systems of the nodes and then uh, here we decided to present some um, three most commonly used ones which is uh, CentOS, uh, Ubuntu and Debian. And uh, here are presented some network statistics of the nodes. And we here presented uh, like a number of nodes with or without IPv6 enabled interfaces, top 10 processor speed of nodes and interface capacity of the nodes. So if I go here, 
you can see that here we used a value mapping because we want to we wanted to present these uh, values uh, in uh, gigahertz and uh, round it to up to two decimals. And here for interface capacity of the nodes, first we needed to do some transforms because we have here some um, unknown and some negative values. Uh, so after that, we did uh, like we did, uh, we used this uh, override uh, method to uh, present these values with typically large numbers uh, with many zeros into something that is uh, human readable. And for the and I would like you to show you, we implemented some basic uh, filter. And if I go like on, let's say location country and select some, let's say UK, you can see that uh, now we have informations only for this country. and virtualization statistics. And network statistics. Um, so uh, this was an overview of how we visualized information and statistics um, related to persona or community. So if you have some questions or comments, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Katarina and Andriana, for this presentation. Um, is there any yeah, questions to Katarina and Andriana? Um, I just quick, have you run the, the, the duplicate ha host hash numbers against um, things like see if they're virtual machines or physical machines? I, I'm quite intrigued by this. Because normally the hashing is supposed to be quite um, unique. Yeah, but uh, that is the, that is true actually. But we cannot control the data that is stored in the lookup service. We can mm -hmm. just manipulate data after they are stored. I mean, can can you run the, all the duplicates? Can you check to see what type of if they're physical or virtual? Uh, I think yes, we can. Just. A second, I will share screen. Um, just to, sorry. I'm sorry, I don't didn't very understand the question. You would like to see um, duplicated uh... host hashes, but to see if they're all virtual or if they're physical machines. The host hashes, you mean the UUID? Yeah. This, okay. Yeah. Oh, so no. from our experience, the when we have duplicate UUID, it's usually because uh, some personal admins have uh, duplicated a, a, an existing uh, installation, and that can yeah. happen both with virtual and uh, with physical uh, installation because sometimes what people do is they install personal on a, on a disk then make an image of the, this disk and duplicate the image uh, to uh, deploy 10 or 20 hosts with the same disk image and with the same setup. Uh, mm. And the UID is generated at installation time. So if you duplicate the installation once it's installed, it will use the same UUID. Yeah, that, that's what we experienced with our PMP nodes where we had this deployment model to create an, an, an image of a single node and then you know distribute the image to the other. So we had to pay attention to, to change to update that. The other uh, key point here too is that that ID is just randomly generated at install time. So it's not based on anything on the system. So it's not like a true like host hash in that sense. So that's why you can run into this problem essentially. If, if you copy the right config file over that contains that ID, you're gonna get duplicates, so. OK, 
Okay. Any other question for Katerina and Andriana, or any other question on the uh, performance and monitoring platform, uh, performance management platform? Sorry, or uh, the data analysis of the of the data that's stored from from the PMP mesh. No, well, I think this is again really good work. I think it's also a good excuse for people to make sure what they put in the lookup directory is, is good information, of course. Um, I think if people see there are good tools around, then um, they might be more inclined to check what they're putting in. Yeah, for, from my per perspective, the information from the lookup service is particularly useful. I really find that new interface. Uh, interesting i mean you we usually look for the admins for instance for the node it's not always filled in uh, although it's it's particularly useful when you want to um, find an, 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 and ask a question of a node why something is not working or whatever mm. uh, then you can easily browse and, and find that person so so um yeah it's, it's yeah contact details are obviously contact details. so it's, it's it's a small you know it's a small piece of information but particularly useful for the instances definitely yeah i see olaf has a question too yeah it's 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 more like a comment because uh, i'm trying to run such a measurement network too and uh, um, uh, we also lately have started to, to to put together statistics and try to see systematic errors that we find and not just by discovering you know bad values when you look at the data but uh, as you do know we do more, more cross reporting our data so so have you improved the operations of the network uh, after you know doing such comprehensive statistics and all of you so have you managed to get it into the the maintenance of a a, a a test framework because my experience is that you know you, you're never finished and new errors uh, occur all the time so how, how are your experiences with the with the following up on the data So sorry, I was, I was trying to kind of process the question a little bit. So is, is kind of our experience with validating the data that's in the lookup service? Is that kind of the, the thrust of it? Um, you know, because one aspect of this is, you know, we don't control these. We're kind of just, you know, passive observers of what's out there, right? And so we kind of do our best. You know, we've run into problems. There, there's some stuff that's obviously wrong, right? Like when you see stuff that's in the middle of the United States, but is showing up over in China if they have their lat long filled out. It's like, oh, well, they forgot a negative sign, right? Like, <laughs> uh, and stuff like that. So, so, you know, we've long been kind of trying to play whack-a-mole and, and what layer do you try and correct that at? Do you do that at the visualization layer? Do you try and do it sooner um, and things like that? And I think we're still trying to find that right balance. And I think like, uh, you know, you guys like this, that, that kind of clearly show what's going on, help us get there because we can kind of see the problems and then have those discussions about how to tackle it. I don't know that we'll ever solve it, kind of like you just alluded to. I think it's just one of those ongoing things and you'll find new ways to break stuff. Um, Cause yeah, again, we don't entirely control the data and it's some ways garbage in garbage out <laughs> type situation you get in, so. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so you see the same, uh, no, okay, yes. Thanks. And uh, yeah, what, what we can add uh, probably to the presentation from Andriana and Katarina is that uh, as, as uh, they said, uh, the public dashboard will be uh, publicly available, uh, but we still haven't decided on the, the final host name to be, to be used. But uh, once uh, it's done, we'll uh, uh, distribute that information on the Persona user list and on different channels. and. Uh, you'll be able to access this this dashboard uh, uh, freely. Right. So if there are no more questions or comments, uh, I think uh, we are nearly right on time for for the break. 
Uh, and to follow up on the, the agenda, the second session is going to start in about uh, 12, 12 minutes. So at uh, 12.30 UTC time and convert to your to your own local time um, and we'll have then free new presentation. Uh, so let's meet again shortly. Welcome back everyone. Um, so we'll start again now with the um, with the, the next session of uh, our second day of the, the workshop. Um, and uh, we will, uh, for this session, we will uh, have again um, three presentations and the uh, first one will be about the new uh, backend uh, that's used that will be used in the, the upcoming uh, 5.0 version then the second one will be about the 5.0 migration and the beta testing uh, uh, program that uh, will uh, invite you to to uh, participate into and then uh, a discussion or presentation about uh, a new architecture for streaming measurements with uh, pscanner so uh, let's start right away with uh, the presentation from uh, Luan from uh, RNP. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, so let me just share the screen. Okay, so um, hello everyone. I'm Luan Hughes from RNP, and today I'm going to present to you the new storage archive that will be employed in Persona 5. Um, the new archive is based on the ELK stack that some of you already know. Um, and to be more specific, it's actually based on a fork of Elasticsearch that was created by Amazon, that is Open Search. Um, to first contextualize a little bit, the last major bump of Persona was uh, from three to four, and that happened six years ago, more or less. And right now, some major changes have been ongoing, which have led the team to decide that it was time for Persona 5. So among those changes, one of the bigger ones is the one I'm going to talk with you about today. And that is the overhaul of Persona this is measurement storage. Okay, so um, first, it's necessary to talk about some of the motivations behind this change. Um, currently, the default way to visualize personas measurement data is through MedDash, uh, which highlights problems when metrics like throughput or packet loss fall below certain thresholds. A graph is also available in order to look more closely at the measurements between a pair of nodes. At some point, though, uh, problems get complicated enough that you want to be able to easily integrate these uh, persona metrics with other data, such as interface stats, um, flow data, or whatever else you have access to in your, uh, in your network. So in order to do this, the way the data is stored and what metadata is accessible in this moment of storage is critical. As it currently stands, Persona is not in the best position to handle these tasks. And a lot of it comes down to the archive that we're gonna talk about today. So uh, when we mention an archive in, Perso in Persona, that is the structure where we store the task measurements in the long term. Um, as that is where the data is in, the archive needs to be able to pass that information on to the visualization tools. In this image, we see that Persona's current archive, Esmond, is receiving data from the scheduler and providing it to the current visualizations 
that are graphs, Matlash, and trace rock viewer. So um, Asmund is the default archive of Persona right now. Asmund is a jungle web that uses two databases, uh, PostgreSQL and Cassandra, to store, to store the measurements data and metadata. Asmund employs a custom REST API that feeds that data into the visualization tools and um, it handles, uh, it has a query language that uh, the visualization tools, <coughs> that the visualization tools uh, can talk with it, uh, can use to talk with it. So um, when we compare Asmund with current open source options for storage of time series data, we find it quite lacking. Uh, current storage options have some glaring advantages, um, such as uh, rich query languages that allow for more flexibility when handling the data, and um, a design that, in general, integrates with off-the-shelf visualization platforms, such as Grafana, and a better support overall for data backups, as well as a better scalab scalability, among other advantages. One other issue that Esmond has is the lack of stability, with Cassandra currently being one of the main sources of issues in the user list. Other storage options also provide easier maintainability due to having less custom code being necessary for things to run as intended um, in the domain-specific scenarios. So uh, to replace Asmund, the solution that was chosen was the Elk stack. The Elk stack is comprised of Elasticsearch for data storage, Logstash for data processing, and Kibana for data visualization. Currently, Elk is one of the most widely used storage solutions out there providing flexible data management and powerful data analysis tools. With the wide use that it has today, the solution also benefits from a very big and active community, meaning that less time will be spent solving issues that someone has already encountered before. One other benefit is that many visualizations platforms already support uh, Elasticsearch as a data source. This is good for Persona as it addresses the issue of integrating the Persona archive with new visualization tools that allow for that data to be um, more, um, how could I say this? Allow for that data to be uh, presented side by side with different data sources and to have a, a greater understanding of the network status. Uh, one example of a visualization that already accepts data from Elasticsearch and um, is uh, one of the, the tools that uh, we have tested uh, um, Persona data with is Grafana. Uh, Grafana is widely used today as well and is one of the more powerful visualization tools out there with a huge ecosystem of plugins for data sources, dashboards, and more that allow for a great customization of the information that will be displayed to the end user. So um, now we need to talk about uh, the Elastic licensing changes that have been happening recently. So um, to give some context, Elastic has always had a tired licensing model with the core of it using the Apache 2 license, just as Persona, uh, a basic tire license with some features such as auth and some other more basic features and a commercial license with the more advanced features. In 2019, Amazon decided to build a service out of Elasticsearch using the code that was under the Apache license and re-implementing themselves the features that were in in other tiers, such as the auth features, the security features, and so on. Since then, whenever Elastic did a release, Open Distro, which was this fork of Elasticsearch that Amazon made, uh, would merge in the new changes, and they 
uh, they try to maintain the API compatibility with uh, the other um, the other tools in the Elk stack, such as Logstash and Kibana, and will try to make things compatible in general. In 2021, Elastic decided that they had enough and they changed the code that was under the Apache 2 license to a server-side public license while adding license checks in Logstash and Kibana to make things more challenging for Amazon going forward. In order to deal with this change, Amazon themselves came up with the um, successor, you could say, to Open Distro, which is Open Search. So, in the end, um, the Persona team decided to have the new Persona default archive rely on Open Search, as that is under the Apache license, the same the same that Persona is under. And uh, what is Open Search? Well, Open Search uh, is uh, a fork of the last Elasticsearch version that was under the Apache license, uh, 7.10. And Open Search has all the core features of Elasticsearch at, at that time, plus the additional features that were uh, that were re-implemented, that were present in the higher tires of Elasticsearch and were re-implemented for Open Distro, such as the security plugin, the index state management uh, policies, the alerting system, and the performance analyzer. Um, there is a there are many more plugins that Open Search currently has. In the latest release, they added some new ones, but basically, basically, it, they can be found in in Open Search website. So uh, I'll link that later in the presentation. Um, okay, so uh, in order to understand how this new archive works, first we have to look at the software pieces that compose it and understand how they work together. First, inside the scheduler component, we have an HTTP archiver that will send the measurement data to the endpoint dash log stash in which the archive will be running. Uh, a, a proxy will then uh, verify the authorization that is being sent with the persona request and will pass it on to the Logstash pipeline. Um, there, the data will be processed and can be enriched with metadata hailing from multiple sources. Um, as an example, with GeoIP, we can have the geolocations of the task's source and destination based on their IPs. Um, this kind of metadata could then be used to generate dynamic map visualizations out of the box and what else you can think about to use with this. So um, Logstash's pipeline also supports um, data processing inside Ruby scripts. And this basically makes it possible for any metadata to be added to the task measurements that is available, making Persona way better positioned to handle some domain specific constraints and some uh, more tough problems that I mentioned before. Uh, after being processed, the document uh, is then output to the open source server and um, there it's, it, it, it started. So, okay, just a second. Um, in order for the transition to this new archive to be as painless as possible, an API was created to emulate the uh, ASMOND for the visualizations that currently interact with it, such as Medash. Um, that is ASMOND, which will read the queries from the visualizations and collect the data from the open search instance and translate everything to make this communication possible. With this, all the visualizations that we had before available will remain working and new visualizations will now be able to interact directly with open search to query data from there. Grafana and open search dashboards are some of the more prominent options for this. Uh, and with Grafana, just as an example, 
we can display personal data in the same uh, graph as other measurement data that is collected from a different approach, such as Prometheus, or even uh, display side one atop the other and uh, data collected from different tools used by Persona itself. So with that, we can uh, have more flexibility when dealing with the data monitoring that we have access to. So um, with that, we have a basic understanding of how the new archive works, but how does that affect Persona's current architecture? As it turns out, not a whole lot will change. Uh, the new components map to existing bundles without disrupting the overarching structure of Persona too much. Um, here we see the relationship between the packages of Persona 4. Uh, we can see that the current archive as one is a dependency of both Persona core and central management and nothing other than that. When it comes to the package relationships that we will have in Persona 5, what was Esmond is now replaced by the archive package and its dependencies, which consist of three main dependencies in case, which are Open Search, Persona Elmond, and Persona Logstash. The other relevant change regarding the archive itself is the addition of Persona dashboards, which um, configures open search stock data visualization, open search dashboards to work with the, the Persona um, open search installation. So uh, we can see that other than the replacement of Esmond, the package relationships of Persona 5 remain the same as before. So the bundles will not change and uh, it's basically going to be transparent for most users. Um, and uh, well, to end this presentation, I'll give a quick, quick overview of the packages that are relating to this new archive. Okay, so first is Elmond, uh, which is one of the archive dependencies. Elmond is a Flask application that serves the purpose of converting the Esmond queries that are sent from MedDash and our visualizations into queries that can be understood by OpenSearch. Uh, Elmond's configurations files lies on etc persona elmond elmond.conf and this file will basically contain the information necessary for Elmond to connect with the OpenSearch instance. Um, Persona log stash, which is one of the major packages of the new archive, it basically maintains the log stash pipeline that will be used to process and enrich the measurement data before archiving it to open search. This pipeline is currently divided in seven steps. First, the input, where it's defined the um, destination for the uh, where the data will arrive at Logstash. Uh, as we use the proxy to configure that, uh, there is not much to look at here, but if uh, any domain specific scenarios need you to change that, it's also not very hard. Uh, the files are located in USR Leap Persona Logstash pipeline. And after changing them, just need to restart Logstash to get them working again. Uh, the second through sixth step are uh, data processing steps. In the second, the scheduler object is built. In the third, the IP addresses are normalized. In the fourth step, uh, the conversion of the ISO 8601 durations uh, go into seconds. Uh, the fifth step, step deals with the GeoIP information and the sixth deals with the task specific processing. Um, the sixth step has a different file for each uh, kind of task. Okay, uh, the last step is the output where the processed data is then sent as a document to be stored in OpenSearch. Uh, as the output stores it in OpenSearch, uh, it uses some environment variables, 
variables that are set in a logstash sysconfig file to set up this connection. The pipeline, uh, as I mentioned, is located in USRLE personal logstash pipeline. And any changes that uh, the user makes will not be overwritten by another logstash update. So the user can feel free to um, customize this to whatever, uh, whatever constraints they have. Okay, um, to finish things, uh, the archive is the crux of these new packages. And it's here where most of the configurations take place. First, the security configurations in which the certificates, the new users, the new roles, and the new role mappings are set up. Um, the updated relation of users and passwords is saved in etc personal open search auth setup dot out. Um, all of this information that I'm, I'm saying here, uh, you don't need to worry because that is going to be documented. So you can find it um, in the documentation without, without problem. Uh, it's also in this package that the default indices and index templates are created, as well as the default index state management policy uh, that handles uh, the deletion of um, data that uh, I think right now it is set up that data that is six months old to be deleted, but that can also be changed by uh, whatever, whatever needs you have. Um, and it's also here that the credentials that are necessary to authenticate with the proxy that will pass on the, the task measurements to Logstash are set up. And they are stored in etc personal Logstash proxy auth.json. Uh, the toolkit package later uh, already puts them in the default archive. So uh, you probably will not need to worry about this. And uh, uh, finishing it, this package also configures Elmond to connect with the open search instance, finishing the setup that is necessary for the old visualizations to be able to interact with the new backend. So um, that was what I had intended for this presentation. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. So Antoine, if you... Thank, thank you very much, Luan, for this presentation. Uh, is there any question? Uh, hello. Yeah, uh, um, very uh, good talk. It's a well structured uh, approach to, to getting the new storage in. Um, but uh, I wonder if, did you think about uh, trying to support uh, the old and the new storage in parallel so that you could keep the old uh, uh, databases and, and then make uh, this new uh, plugin or, or this new module? Access both Kibana uh, and uh, or uh, the old Esmond uh, transparently. Um, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this. I, I can take that one, one if you want. Okay. It kind of leads into my next talk too. Um, yeah. So yeah, we definitely did think about that, um, and I'll, I'll get into some of the reasons I guess in my talk for why we're not doing that. The the, the short version is though, if we do that, we never stop supporting Esmond, and it's got some seriously old library issues and, and, and things like that, that it's better if we just rip the Band-Aid off. <laughs> it's basically what it boils down to, but, but I'll talk about that in a moment, so. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, and you want to this, go ahead. Yeah, if, if there are no more questions about uh, Luan's presentation, I think it's the right time for you to continue on this, Andy. All right, well, then I will share my screen. All right. 
Um, yeah, so I think uh, Juan's talk kind of leads in well to what I'll be talking about, which is the actual migration from the current version of Personar to 5.0 um, and that this, the steps that people will uh, kind of need to take and uh, wrap up to with talking about um, when and how you'll be able to kind of get started uh, doing that here in the very near future. Um, so I think we've seen this picture a lot and it's been popping up in a lot of the presentations, but just kind of wanted to recap, you know, kind of when thinking about this and thinking about your current nodes, kind of what they look like. Um, you know, this is our persona, the current, you know, 4.x uh, architecture. Um, and so, you know, as I think Luan very uh, described very well, is most of the changes in 5.0 are coming at this kind of archiving layer, and then it'll open up some new options here at that kind of this visualization layer uh, as well. Um, and so when we think about kind of the current set of installs, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of components in that, that last picture. And some people start, install all or most of those. Um, you know, some hosts have just a, a subset of those, and that all really is kind of dependent on what we call the bundle that you have installed. Um, so we have a few different bundles. Um, by far, our most popular bundle is, is the Persona Toolkit, kind of described here. Um, and so that's, you know, you do the yum install or app get install Persona Toolkit, um, and you get a bunch of UIs, you get the archive, um, you get P scheduler, you know, you get pretty much the whole, whole shebang there um, when you do that, uh, which is great for kind of individual or a small set of, of deployments. Um, or, or kind of just getting your feet wet with, with Persona for the first time. Um, but once you kind of get into larger deployments, you usually some of our under, other bundles uh, come into play where you don't necessarily want all the UIs and an archive everywhere. You maybe have a you know, bunch of measurement hosts that you really want to just kind of run P-Scheduler and run the tests um, and then archive to a central place uh, or, or similar. You know, there's lots of variations on, on that model that you can do. Um, so we have these, this other set of bundles that we support. Um, uh, so Persona Tools is really just the basic stuff, uh, uh, just like CLI, the CLI commands, basically. You don't even have a full you know, P scheduler or scheduler on there. Uh, you can just do like third-party tests, essentially, uh, and things like that. Um, the test point, which is, uh, is probably our second most popular, which is usually when you have those individual measurement hosts out there. Um, it adds kind of the P scheduler layer and the PS config layer and lookup service registration and all of that. Um, and then you can configure it to, to send, you know, send stuff to a, a central location. Um, we have another one uh, that is sometimes useful when you want just kind of what's in the test point plus the archive locally. It's called Persona Core. It's kind of the foundation for the toolkit. It's kind of like toolkit without all the UIs essentially. Um, and then the kind of the last one is something called Persona Central Management. I'll be talking about that more a little bit later. But the idea behind this was, okay, you have a bunch of test points all around. Um, this is just kind of a quickie package to give you your archive and your visualization all on, on kind of one host. Um, and so, you know, those are, those are basically the bundles. And, and the reason I talk about this is uh, when we get into kind of the migration, uh, depending on what bundle you have installed will kind of affect what, what the migration uh, kind of looks like for you. Um, so here's Persona 5.0, uh, kind of an updated diagram we have here. So you'll see now this admin is open search and log stash, which again was, was described very succinctly. Uh, and we have a few other visualization options I've, I've, I've thrown up here um, as well. Uh, so kind of looking at the migration, so kind of, uh, you know, with respect to, to Olaf's question, uh, we made the decision to do no data migration from Esmond to the new archive. Uh, so there's a few reasons for this. Um, for one, to run both systems in parallel would probably exhaust the resources of a lot of the hosts, or especially a lot of the toolkits that are out there. Um, in general, a lot of the tools kits are under spec for what we already <laughs> uh, recommend. Uh, people run with, with, with Desmond and things like that. So running Esmond uh, plus, you know, the, the open search stack and things like that could potentially stress those out a little bit while also doing a data migration and, and trying to move all those. Uh, so, so that's a challenge. Um, the other piece is that the data kind of, uh, it ages out uh, right now, I think after about six months in most cases anyways. Um, so, you know, you're kind of just buying yourself a little bit of time here. Um, now we're not like deleting the data 
uh, or, or things like that, they'll still be the option if you want to re-enable as mint, or you can actually even move the data off to another system and things like that if, if you need to get at it. Um, so I think another thing um, in, in Olaf's question was, well, another approach you could take is trying to have some layer that glues the two of them together. We also wanted to avoid that, again, for the support uh, kind of burden reasons. And in particular, you know, Esmond is getting quite long in the tooth in terms of there's a bunch of weird Cassandra related libraries that it uses and, and things like that. And part of the reason we're moving is Esmond got to a point that we were going to need to rewrite significant portions of it if we needed to um, continue to support it. Uh, and we don't want to do that work and move to the new archive. Uh, and I mean, just based on experience, if if we don't have hard stops on things, you know, we, we end up kind of supporting them forever. So um, uh, we, we kind of think this is probably the, the best long-term approach um, with maybe a little bit of, of short-term pain for people. Um, uh, so so that, that's kind of uh, what we're doing there. And there's a little bit of subtlety too there in terms of how we do auto updates, which is kind of the next point. Um, so everything, uh, but social management will kind of auto update and I'll walk through each case and kind of what that actually means for them because for some of them that doesn't mean mean very much. Um, uh, but the central management like the central archives are uh, a little bit different case so we were a little bit more conservative to give people more kind of manual controls about when that migration happens and don't just kind of blow up. Um, you know, all their entire measurement system, you know, with hosts writing to it that maybe they don't even, you know, that the person running the central management node doesn't even control. Uh, so then, you know, actual kind of software migration is, is part of part of it. There's also the IP, API migration aspect. So Luan talked about, we do have an API compatibility layer through Elmond that basically translates Esmond style requests to the Elastic or the OpenSearch backend. Um, so, so, so that's available on all the hosts. And I'll actually show an example of that uh, when we, we get there. Um, and then uh, there is one kind of completely unrelated to the archiving. There is one P scheduler test limits change that, that may or may not affect you, uh, which I have a, a brief description of on the next slide. Um, so this is right now, this should be the only manual thing you'll potentially have to do. And I think for the vast majority of people, it won't, e it won't even affect them. Um, so, and I believe also too, in our 4.4 release notes, we warned that this was, was deprecated, but I know not everybody, you know, pays attention to those super closely. Um, so, so basically there was this old limit type in the PCR files called the test limit type that just matched on uh, a test. And, and then you could kind of limit the, the parameters. Uh, this has been kind of consolidated into the, uh, uh, the JQ limit type uh, just because it's more general. Um, and there was some overlap there. If you're running kind of the default set of limits that ships with any of our you know any of the various bundles, um, this will get um, uh, you'll be fine. It'll just get replaced as part of the the package update. Um, if you've made kind of manual changes and in particular using this test type, um, you might have to to uh, kind of manually go in and, and clean stuff up, and, and and we can kind of help people. With that, uh, you know, we plan to have a few examples and, and things like that. So hopefully, hopefully nothing too bad. Um, but then, kind of getting back to actually moving the packages around, let's look at each individual bundle and what that means. So tools and test point. So these are the easy ones, right? You're just looking at like the command line tools for the tools. That's super easy, really. Nothing has changed there. Uh, and then say it's pretty much the same for test point, right? You don't have an archive on these nodes. So it's just like really any other update. You know, you'll get a new version of P scheduler. There's some you know great new features in there. You might need to look for the limits thing, uh, potentially. Um, but beyond that, really, really, there's nothing to worry about because you don't have data on these hosts. Um, and, and again, it's it's kind of like your your standard update. Um, and then kind of core and toolkit. That's where we start getting into actually having to worry about data. Right, so our plan for this is to enable auto updates. So when we do the final release of 5.0, if you have auto updates enabled, you will get the new version of the toolkit. Um, so we plan to give people adequate warning before this happens and multiple reminders and instructions how to disable auto updates if, if you're worried about this. Um, but when the auto update happens, your data will not be migrated to the new system. Now we won't delete it, it'll still be on disk. Um, and so we'll basically just shut Eismond off, turn the new stuff on, and then we'll provide instructions for how to re-enable as men if you need to access the old data or need to move the old data to a new machine, things like that, kind of like I, I just covered. 
Um, and then for central management, so this is where you have kind of one node that's dedicated to archiving things. And, you know, I'm specifically talking about where you typed in, you know, you, you did your, um, oh, you know, yum install personal central management, that type thing. Um, this will not automatically get updated to the new archiving system. Uh, the reason for this is if you're running this, there's a good chance that, uh, you know, all the nodes, you, you might control them all, but it's also possible they're across different institutions in some cases, and, and people might be upgrading at different times um, and things like that. So we just we want to give people a little bit more control about when they move stuff over. You know, they might have more data too, so they might be a little bit con more concerned about it. Um, you can kind of, you know, the Esmond Archive plugin is still in Peace Scheduler, so it can continue to work if you don't change kind of the central config in, in that sense. So um, as, as kind of people uh, um, uh, update, you know, you can move that over or maybe you'll just be able to move over your config. You actually don't need a new version of pscheduler to support that because psche support the new archiver because it's just using the HTTP plugin that's been around for a while. Um, but still, we just wanted to give people greater control. The other piece of this too is part of the reason it doesn't auto update is we're actually dropping the perf zone or central management bundle. It's always kind of been a weird bundle anyways, because um, I'm not, it's not entirely clear. You always really want kind of the visual, the mad dash and, and the archive on the same node. If you do want that, you can still do, you know, again, yum install. We have a persona archive package that basically sets up the, all the elastic stuff that you'd need or the open search stuff. Sorry, I, I can't uh, get out of the habit of saying elastic. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, mad dash. And actually, if you type that in, it's actually less characters than persona or central management. So if you know, that was really the, the only difference was trying to save people time. Um, so that, you know, your typing there will, will actually be a little bit shorter. So, um, uh, so, so that, that's basically the changes for, for central management. Um, and then uh, this slide probably looks really familiar. Just, you know, at the API layer, we have this Elmon thing. Um, so I think I have a couple minutes, so I'm just going to very quickly just do a demo, just to highlight a couple things. Uh, so I actually have a 5.0 toolkit running here. Um, this is just kind of on a dev VM. It's actually in uh, uh, Google Cloud. Uh, uh, I kind of just created it to, to, to mess around with a few things. Uh, you can see the toolkit looks pretty similar. There's some changes in services up here. In particular, it no longer says Esmond. Uh, you have this archive and it has a bunch of bunch of different links to the API and, and the various pieces that it's checking. Um, you can see down here kind of the graphs and everything looks the same. I've had some tests running for a while um, and you'll see it's, it's just the same old graphs um, and kind of the results here. And again, this is uh, running in, in Google Cloud. So some firewalls, I'm, I'm getting quite a bit of loss here because I, I think some ports are blocked, um, which is fine for my purposes. And now uh, there we go. So you've gotten away my tabs there. Um, so that all looks the same. And kind of the reason this works is you can kind of see if you're familiar with the Esmond API, um, you know, we can actually go to the exact same endpoint we've always gone to for Esmond. And you'll see this looks, you know, very much like Esmond JSON. This is actually talking to the open search backend. Um, and, and so again, you know, a lot of this should be pretty transparent. So if you have tools talking to an API, like, you know, the Esmond API, it should continue to, to work as normal. Uh, and then just the last thing I wanted to show is we actually have one additional package. Um, we might want to actually end up renaming it before the final release. It's called Persona Dashboards right now, uh, but it basically gives you the open search version of Kibana uh, called Open Search Dashboards. Um, and if you install that, you get a very Kibana like interface here. Um, and you can actually kind of look at the data and explore it. Uh, so you can kind of see you know, all the results you've been getting. And it's a good way to kind of look at the records um, and just kind of get a feel for what things look like. Uh, and you can see too, like we, we do some data typing. So like the IPs are actual IP types. So you can do like subnet searches and things like that. Same deal with like location uh, and things like that. Um, and then one other kind of cool thing too is it's a lot easier to play around with the API now because you have this nice dev tools uh, interface that, you know, again, if you played with Kibana, might, you know, you might be familiar with. Uh, so you can do, you know, this is the Elastic API, uh, which is, you know, obviously slightly more complicated, but much more powerful than what we've had in the past. And so you can do, 
you know, searches. This will look at the last day at the throughput tests um, and we'll grab uh, anything in, in, in this subnet here. Obviously I've got like one test running. So not a very, very interesting subnet. You can do searches, kind of look at the results. Um, you know, I could, I could change this and, and this won't match because, you know, I don't have anything that starts with 188.0. Uh, you can also do fun stuff, just kind of one last thing, and then I'll hand it over. Um, you can look at, you know, search by country. And so again, I only have like one test running to a host in the United States. So we'll get my results. And if I were to say something like, you know, France, which I don't have any tests going to France, you know, I, I won't get anything. So again, kind of a, a fun tool set to, to play with here and kind of you know, munge around with the data. Um, so then if I can get the zoom controls out of the way again, um, just to kind of wrap up here. Um, so basically everything I showed will be available uh, starting next Tuesday. So May 31st, we're planning to kind of release the beta. Uh, we'll probably be in beta for quite a while, you know, probably through most of the summer because we want to give people a chance to test it, give us feedback, you know, us to respond to that. Uh, and, and things like that, because obviously this is a, a pretty big change. Um, at first, the beta will be available for CentOS 7 on May 31st, um, uh, but we will be uh, providing uh, CentOS 8 package, or I'm sorry, uh, Alma Linux 8 packages, and they seem to work on Rocky as well, uh, very shortly after that, as well as the Debian and Ubuntu packages, and I think we have one on OS support later. Uh, but, but that'll come just shortly after. We're really close on that. We just kind of want to get people a chance to play with it. And we have the CentOS 7 stuff ready to go. So we want to get that out the door. Um, and for instructions on how to use that, there's a link here that will also be in the emails that go around about the beta, about how to set up your system um, to do that. It's just pointing at the right YUM repo or uh, you know, uh, apt repo to, uh, uh, to pull down the beta packages. Um, and then that's really it. So yeah, here's a summary of the stuff I talked about. And any any questions? That up, I guess. Andy, if I could just add a, a comment to the uh, the changes to the uh, the limit stuff um, that's uh, that's coming up. Um, none of the basically all we're doing in five as Andy said, is we're we're deprecating one piece. Um, if you need to make changes ahead of the shift to five the existing 4.x software will 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 run those changes no problem. So you don't there isn't. There isn't, a, there isn't going to be a date where you have to hard cut over. So if you want to experiment with a little bit while we're in beta and get your production systems ready for the upgrade, then you can do that without having a whole lot of, uh, a lot of heart, a whole lot of heartburn. Yep. That's a good point. Thank you very much for your presentation, Andy. Is there any more questions? Hello, Matej Vanyal from Arnes. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Ah, okay. Please Sorry. <laughs> um, for people that are running their own um, Elasticsearch and Kibana stack, will they be able to use that to store the measurements, or is it a requirement to use the? Uh, no. Yes, you will be able to. Actually, at YesNet, we have like a big 30 node elastic cluster where we store lots of stuff. Um, and so we will be using that as well. So the plan is that'll work. I mean, one nice thing about Pete Scheduler, you know, for a while has been we're not really locked into any one one backend in that sense. We just have to ship something as the default with the toolkit. But if you want to, you know, just change that last step of the log stash uh, output to be your elastic search instance, or even if you have your own log stash, you know. Those options are available, and we're kind of working on the documentation to do that because we we assume that'll be a pretty common thing. Because, I mean, I've even seen Elastic mentioned in multiple presentations here. It's a pretty common thing in our community. Or if you want to play with Influx or something like that, that's entirely possible. So, cool. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, then if not, uh, we can continue to the 
next presentation in this session, uh, which is a presentation by Mark about a new architecture for streaming measurements. Thanks, Antoine. Let's see if I have any, any better luck sharing the screen today than I did yesterday. Let's see. Is that visible to everyone? Yes. Excellent. Good. Um, so um, I'll give the same disclaimer I did yesterday. I am fighting a little bit of a cough, and I will try not to hack in your ears too much um, as, I, as I do this. So uh, good morning to everyone on, on my side of the pond, and good afternoon to everyone on your side of the pond. Um, my name is Mark Fight. I work for Internet2, and I am a member of the personal development team. So today we've today and yesterday, we've talked a little bit about uh, things that have happened in previous releases and what's coming up in the next release. And I'm going to talk today about some things that are uh, that we're looking at uh, to do in in future releases. Uh, I will start by saying that the um, that this is advanced material. Um, it is not required uh, by any stretch of the imagination for everyday use of Personar or P scheduler. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is very much kind of P-Scheduler inside baseball. It's kind of uh, some, some things that we're going to be doing in the guts of it. Um, most of it is not, um, is not going to affect how you do things on a, on a daily basis as far as making measurements or anything else like that. Um, but we are going to talk about some, uh, some tools that we intend to develop. Um, second disclaimer, uh, everything I talk about here today is being considered for a release that may happen sometime later than today. That's kind of my standard disclaimer on that. Um, none of it exists yet. Um, so we're, we're pretty much we're, we're pretty much to the point where we've kind of done some of the initial planning on it um, and we'll probably start implementing it uh, maybe over the summer. Um, anyone who's been using uh, Personar for a long time is probably familiar with uh, the concept of streaming measurements. Um, which are necessary because there are some events that cause problems that are transient and won't be picked up by doing, say, a throughput measurement once every four hours. Uh, even if you even if you did it more frequently, continuous throughput measurements very expensive. And if you keep doing it, you're eventually going to get a call from your management where they ask if the network is there for your test traffic or for the traffic that your that your users are supposed to be using your network to carry. There are, however, a lot of measurements that can be done continuously. Uh, specifically latency and loss are relatively low bandwidth and don't consume, uh, they don't consume much network resources and they don't consume much in the way of processor resources as well. Um, and the good thing about them is, is that they sort of, changes in those can, can imply larger problems. Um, if, you've, if you've sat through any of our previous presentations, you've probably seen this, this chart, which, uh, which describes what happens uh, with TCP when you have a small amount of, uh, of packet loss as, uh, as the round trip time increases. And the kind of the, the nutshell version is that as you, as you get that packet loss and the, the round trip time increases, things, things really go bad pretty quickly. Uh, and that's just sort of a, a, a side effect of the physics of the way TCP works. Um, and that sort of, leads, sort of leads you to the question as well, is this throughput measurement really necessary? And the answer is maybe not. You may be able to look at some of the things that cause it, like, um, you know, like uh, finding and fixing the loss and maybe doing, a, a, you know, maybe doing an ad hoc throughput measurement just to make sure that what you changed, uh, what you changed worked. Inside of P-Scheduler, if you do a measurement, obviously it's going to consume some could uh, it's going to consume some resources because it is obviously software and software you know needs resources to run. So what you end up with when you do a single measurement um, is you consume one thread inside of P-Scheduler's runner service, which is what's in charge of, of overseeing all this. Um, you you consume one process, which is the uh, the tool plugins run method, and this is the the program that is the the glue between P scheduler and the measurement tool that you're running, say ping or iperf3. And of course that, um, that consumes another process itself. Um, not too bad so far. There is a tool called PalStream that I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. Um, it is part of the OAMP family of tools. Um, the best, uh, the, on the best authority that I have, PalStream stands for persistent OAMP stream. Um, it is an old program. There are only a few people, I think, who've been around long enough to, to remember when it was first developed. But what PalStream gives you is continuous measurements of latency loss and jitter, among other things. And the way it operates now is that it aggregates multiple measurements into a single result. Usually, I think we do minute boundaries. And optionally, you can put per packet data into those, which kind of swells the size of the results. Um, but it's not really, uh, 
it's not really a, a continuous stream per se. It's as kind of as close to continuous as we get right now. Um, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and running PalStream consumes some additional resources. Uh, on top of the, the main process, PalStream also forks off two additional processes to conduct the measurement. And there's a process that has to be run periodically by the tool plugin to take the results that PalStream produces and convert them into something that's usable. So in total, you end up with one thread and four processes and, a, a, and an itinerant process that gets run to, to do all this. Now, this kind of sounds worse than it is. Um, you have lots of, lots of copies of the same programs running at the same time. Uh, and you have lots of things like shared code and data pages that the system takes care of kind of deduplicating for you. So you're not, you're not consuming as much. Um, this does have some, some implications for large scale applications though when it gets big. If you were with us in November and you saw uh, Sean McKee's presentation about what they're doing over at WLCG, uh, he showed this slide, which has a, a summary of what they're doing measurement wise. Um, and on a per day basis, it turns out that they're actually doing quite a, quite a large number of measurements. Uh, if you add this up, it's about 18 and a quarter million measurements daily uh, just across their systems. Um, so that's reasonably high volume. And WLCG for many years has sort of been our, our high watermark for what we have to meet um, with, uh, with performance. Since the beginning of, uh, of 4.0, which was five years ago now, um, the uh, the threading architecture for doing these measurements has been I won't call it naive but it's been it's been sort of conventional I guess um, and the runner service which takes care of, um, of of overseeing all these measurements for each measurement would start a thread that thread would start the the run method in the tool plugin which uh, which oversees the the actual making of the measurement um, and that works just fine uh, up to a point. But we are, we are starting to see things where we're starting to get strangled by the Python that we use to implement this. Um, we selected Python initially because it was, it was, um, it was a, a well understood language within the user community and it didn't mean that you had to have a bunch of eggheads like me in an ivory tower to work on it. Um, so, and I actually still don't regret that choice. I think it was still, um, I, I, still I still think it was a good thing to do. Um, the limitation in Python, it, it does have multi-threading, obviously, because we have programs that use it. Um, but its limitation is that the the uh, there's a thing inside of it called the global interpreter lock that makes any program effectively single core, um, and therefore you sort of run out of uh, you run out of smoke for what you can do on a, on a single core with some of these things. So in 5.0, and this was actually something we had intended to hold for 5.1, but we started to see the <laughs> we started to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and it turned out to be a train. Um, the, uh, the gill was starting to limit the number of, of usable threads. And as I kind of hinted at before, that's become a bit of a problem with, uh, with high volume applications. Um, so in order to, to head that off, um, things have been shifted around a little bit so that the, the runner process and, and any other process that's, that's multi-threaded delegates it, its work to child processes. And each child process is set to, to be capped at a relatively small numbers of, of threads per child. We have that initially set at 20. I suspect that during the beta, we'll get some, we'll get some feedback about how good a number that is. And we may, up, we may adjust it up or down depending on, on what we see happening. The good part about this is it allows us to take advantage of more cores when available. Um, one of the things about like a lot of the WLCG systems is that many of them have lots of cores um, and many of them are, are kind of sit idle, so this will this will take advantage of that um, and and make things probably make make uh, measurement throughput a little a little faster and get rid of some of the latency that happens um, while things are are kind of queued up waiting to be uh, waiting to be processed. So visually speaking, this is what the new this is what the new threading architecture looks like. Um, so we still have a runner, and the difference is is that we've we've instituted these pools of these workers that are basically pools. Uh, there is one thread per, per pool inside of the runner that oversees the pool. Uh, and there's some IPC that happens uh, between the runner and the pools and each pool starts up uh, worker threads of its own to do the, um, to do the, uh, uh, the actual work. Um, okay, so within, within each pool, um, there's, a, there's some process management that goes on. Um, each, each pool process, as I said, creates worker threads to do each job that needs to be done. And this applies again beyond just the runner. So things like archiving will benefit from this as well. Um, 
but things are generally are generally structured so that the distribution of jobs favors having a lower number of pool processes overall, um, which should keep the number of, of those uh, of those down. We didn't want to have them. It's always nice to have one or two that are kind of ready to work, but it's it's nice to keep those down to a minimum if we can. And what happens with these processes as they go idle, uh, they simply go away. Um, so if, if, if one of these, these pools has been idle for a long period of time, I think we have it set to a minute uh, by default, then they just they get, they get turned off and, and don't consume any more resources. Additionally, we built something in that has the, we built in provisions so that these, uh, these processes can also have a limited lifetime. Uh, for example, you can say, you know, do 10,000 jobs and then, and then you're finished. And if you have anything left over, let that stuff drain out and then just exit. Uh, this will prevent problems that are caused by memory leaks. Um, we haven't really seen that much in the in the five years or so we've been running pscheduler. Um, I think we've seen maybe one or two, but they were they were fairly small. Um, but uh, that will also that will also increase reliability a little bit as well. So the next question is, how do we solve the PAL stream problem? Um, and just to kind of just to kind of recap, our problems with PAL stream right now are resource consumption. And as, uh, as, as Otto mentioned uh, in his talk yesterday, uh, there are new applications that want a stream of individual measurements that's more in real time rather than batched up once per minute. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the aggregation is kind of not good enough anymore. Uh, PalStream, again, is a, is a 20 year old program um, and was never really designed with, with any of this in mind, um, at least not in a way that would, would prevent you know, consuming unreasonable amounts of resources. So conventionally, um, when, when we're doing measurements, and this applies to more than just PAL stream, uh, but the runner has, in the, in the current version, the runner has workers in it uh, that, you know, that fire up PAL stream. Uh, PAL stream does its measurements, and the tool plugin takes care of, of uh, pulling those results out and converting them to something that pscheduler likes and, and, and handing them back to, uh, to pscheduler. So these are, these are kind of, I guess, supervised. And what we propose to, uh, to put in a future version uh, is a concept called unsupervised measurements. Uh, and this, is, this simply is going to entail a variation on the tool plugin uh, where measurements are run independently and don't require the runner's supervision. Um, and the mechanics of that are going to be that, that tool plugins will have a new start method in, in them that pscheduler invokes that says, OK, I have this measurement. It's a long-term thing. It's going to produce multiple results. And the start method will go reach out to an external service that I'll talk about in a minute and provide some information about where it should put results and perhaps an authentication key and, and whatever else we decide it needs to have. The service would send its results directly into pscheduler via the API. So there is no, uh, there's no need for the runner to, to, to kind of reap the stuff and, and do something with it and then put it back into the, into the database. What these will lack is what I showed you in the diagram before, which is the, the, the conventional measurements and the supervised measurements persistent run method, uh, because you won't need that. What will replace it, however, is a new method called check that will check to make sure that the measurement is still happening. So it'll just reach out to the service and say, hey, I asked you to do this a few minutes ago. Are you still doing it? And if not, then similar to what happens now, for example, if the runner, if the runner crashes and it, and it starts up, it will say, Oh yeah, I had this long this long term uh, uh, latency measurement going, and we'll um, you know we'll just we'll restart it because it needs to keep going. Um, so, in order to implement this, um, I am considering uh, developing. It's going to be a new service. Obviously, it's kind of um, it's it's kind of working title is PSLAM for the the Personar Latency Measurement Service, and this is something that will be a complete replacement uh, for for PalStream or for most of it anyway actually for all of it, come to think of it. Uh, and its job is basically to do measurements as directed. Something says, I want you to start doing this measurement, it'll go off and do it. Uh, the architecture of this is going to, is, will take better advantage of, thre of, of the threading that's available on the system. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and should avoid some of Python's, uh, some of Python's pitfalls. So architecturally, the way this works is you'll have pscheduler down in one corner and at the very far end of this, you'll have the functions out of OAMP that, that actually do individual latency measurements. I figure we'll probably have to tie this up with some library for C that, that, handles, uh, that handles JSON. 
I should also point out too that the the uh, OAMP and TWAMP functions themselves are written in C. Um, so all this is going to be just sort of a little a little blob of C that does all this work. And then finally, perhaps uh, libcurl, which is which is kind of famous for for doing uh, um, uh, for doing HTTP requests, um, can be sort of the final thing that takes the finished measurements and sends them directly off to pscheduler. So all of that will be encapsulated in a thing called a measurement thread, uh, and that itself will be kept. It will will be supervised by uh, a thread runner. All this stuff is in C because C does not have any of um, does not have any of Python's limitations on threads. So you can have a you can have a single C program that runs you know five hundred or a thousand threads, and it won't it won't run into any of the same um, any of the same the same problems. Now this of course is only half the story. Um, so there will, there will need to be a little front end for it that will most likely be written in Python and it will have in it uh, a REST API that will probably be developed with Flask, which is the same thing that we use in uh, pscheduler and a couple of other places in the system. And that will be the avenue by which the plugin uh, will, will, will give it work to do. Additionally, on the inside, there'll be some workload management, probably also in Python, because it doesn't need to be high performance or highly threaded or anything else like that. And that'll talk to the thread runner, which will oversee everything else. Um, so that's sort of the, I guess that's sort of the, the high level plan of what this service is going to look like. So the next question is, how do we get there? Um, there's a bunch of things that we have to do. This is not going to be a true, it's not going to be a backbreak of a project, but it's not going to be trivial either. Uh, the first thing is to isolate the OAMP and TWAMP measurement functions that we have in the REST implementation so that we have something that we can make callable as a utility that says, here, just do this, just do this one measurement and give me a result. Uh, we need to change pscheduler so, it, so it, it supports unsupervised measurements. That's all what I described earlier. Um, and of course, we need to develop the, the thing that does a, the thread that does a stream of measurements and the thing, the thread runner that supervises it. And finally, the front end that goes with it. And also, finally, the uh, the the uh, the pscheduler tool plugin that, that can talk to it. Once we've done all those things, if we have something we like, then we can celebrate a little bit and retire Palstream. And I I I totally figure that this will have the same kind of Steinhoist that we had after uh, after retiring BWCTL a few years ago. I'm sure a few people are probably wondering, well, when do we get this? Um, most of what's in this talk encompasses the basic design of it. Um, the isolation of the OAMP and TWAMP functions is already underway at, at a YesNet, or if it's not actually underway, it's close to being underway, but there is somebody who's, who's gonna be doing that work. Um, development of everything else will probably start this summer. And I would look for this probably in a 5.1 or a 5.2. Um, I suspect there are, a few, there are a few feature changes that we've, we're leaving out of 5.0 because they need a little tuning. So there may be, there may be a 5.1, not too far. Uh, not too far after after 5.0. Uh, we do have a couple of other kind of internal fish that we need to fry um, to, uh, you know, to, to improve some other areas in the system. So I can't say, can't give you a definite date yet, but probably late in the summer, we'll have some idea which, which release and, and, and when that's going to happen. So I want to end with a few more disclaimers here. Um, you know, it seems like I'm kind of shirking my responsibility here, but I think this is kind of important to, to talk about. Um, one of the things that that has come up, and I've, we've talked about streaming applications with with a number of people. Um, I, I just want to point out that pscheduler is not suitable for absolutely every streaming application on the planet. Um, 5.0 uh, will be better at handling higher volumes than than 4 was. We just don't quite know how much better it will be yet because we haven't we haven't fielded it. We expect to find a lot of that out um, during beta. There are a lot of other uh, there are a lot of other systems out there that do direct to archive, which probably makes sense in a lot of cases. Um, in situations where you have an extremely high volume, where you have ultra low latency demands, and you have no need for uh, the post processing that pscheduler can do on results or its archiving flexibility, for example, if you know if you if you have the system and it already uh, it already goes straight into your you know your uh, your Elasticsearch and you're querying it with, you know, Grafana or, or Kibana or any of the other Anas, I'm sure there's a few more, um, then integrating with pscheduler may or may not make sense. Um, and it's it's probably something that needs to be looked at on a case by case basis. And I suspect also that as we figure out, as we figure out how the high volume, uh, how the high volume stuff uh, has improved, 
in 5.0, we should have uh, we should have a better idea of of what what things are suitable and and what things aren't. So that's all I have. Um, if you have questions that you don't ask here, please feel free to, to drop me an email. I'm mfight at internet2.edu. And as always, for more information on anything Personar, please visit our website at www.personar.net. Thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, presentation. Sure Any question to Mark? Yeah. I see two raised hands, uh, so let's start with Ivan. Hi, Mark. Um, so in your presentation, I, I noticed that you mentioned about the uh, uh, high volume of uh, measurements uh, with, uh, you know, in AOWCG, uh, but, uh, and, you know, ensuring that some more cores would be available to the, um, to the workers, but I was wondering uh, what about, um, or can that lead to, to another problem, you know, where with saturating uh, uh, all of the cores and um, for example, um, not being able to, um, I'm not sure, to dedicate some cores for measurements. Um, so, uh, more or or even for example for other things so would you suggest that uh, kind of um, this can be limited there at p schedule or perhaps you know now actually then that i'm you know thinking out loud perhaps this should be happening you know on the side of the um you know the the, the deployer who should take care and say, okay, these cores are dedicated for something else, don't touch them. That's actually something we're, we're doing in the internet too. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, I mean, ultimately, obviously the, you know, the, the most that you can process is limited by the size of your machine. You know, I mean, Raspberry Pi can't produce as much as, you know, can't process as much as something that's got 32 or 64 cores in it. Um, one of the things that we're doing at, at internet too, is um, we have, um, and there'll probably be a future talk about this once we have it solidified. But we have we have individual machines in our pops that are actually running two virtual personal nodes in containers that are given dedicated cores and dedicated CPU, and they're and each one is on the is on the the right side of the of the bridge from a uh, hundred gig Ethernet card. Um, so so we sort of we segregated it that way. So it's actually two it's actually two virtual personal nodes that that appear as um, you know that that appear completely independent of each other. Um, you know, similarly, if you, if you have those kinds of limits, probably, I mean, if you, if, if you, if you need to get the processing done, I think having the course available to do it, you know, is, is obviously the, the right way to go. Um, but if you find you want to limit your, you know, your persona down to, um, you know, down to eight or, or 10 cores or six or whatever your, your, whatever your number is, that's probably best done with, with containerization. Um, and we have found that, um, in our, our 100 gig systems um, in the lab, uh, we've been able to get, you know, we've been able to get things like, you know, throughput of about 93 to 94 uh, uh, gigabits per second out of our, our 100 gig card. So there isn't, as long as you set the networking up right, you don't lose anything. Um, you don't lose anything by doing containerization. And on smaller systems, I mean, if you're only doing one gig or 10 gigs, then, um, you know, you're definitely not going to lose anything. You'll still be able to saturate your interfaces with the smaller number of, uh, of cores. Does that answer your question? Well, so, so, a, a bit, I just want to add one other thing too, though. So the, I think an important thing that Mark pointed out in his presentation too, is a lot of this is drawing from like process pools and thread pools. So that's going to put, that's going to put an upper limit on how crazy it can go with this. Right. I mean, that's just standard kind of practice for this type of thing. So, I mean, I, I think that's something we'll have to test, but I mean, yeah, we'll have to look at those numbers and find that right balance. But yeah, there, there should be safety guards in there for to prevent it from going too crazy. Yeah, and and actually, I, I mean, I we want to be better than we are today. Like that's the goal, right? Like I, I don't think we're probably going to make it worse. <laughs> it's pretty bad today. So yeah, yeah, the upper limit was actually the, what I was, uh, you know, looking for as an yeah. alpha. And there are there are upper limits. I, I I can say that what we have the the thread the new threading architecture that we have in 5.0 does have upper limits on it. Um, so I mean it will it will not go infinitely, 
um, but the limits are not so low that that the the high volume users are gonna are gonna run into problems. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, let's see. We had a question from Pete. No. I, I think there was someone else before me, but um, uh, yeah. the, the question I was wondering, that new part you're doing in C, are you, are you, have you thought about using like a, a safe language rather than C? Because C can be quite fickle. Um, uh, yes, it can be. Um, the answer to your question is that the, the existing code that's doing those measurements um, is, is written in C and is well proven. So theoretically, we could... Um, Theoretically, we could attach that to something else like like Rust or or you know there's probably there's a probably a number of of good candidates for that. Uh, I think probably we're just going to have to look at it and see no pun intended uh, and and just you know see how much see how much code we're actually developing for this because a lot of stuff is going to be with you know is probably going to be just uh, you know short passes through well proven libraries and the the amount of glue that we have to write should not be um, should not be excessive. So we, we'll take a look at that. One of the things that I'm trying to do is minimize the number of languages that we have in the system so that we don't end up, we don't end up having something esoteric that we have to go find a specialist to work on. Um, you know, I mean, I think probably, you know, I know there are at least three or four people on the project now that are, that are proficient in C and can write, can write safe code. Um, you know, whereas I don't think, I don't know that like any of us develops like in, in Rust right now. So there's, um, you know, there's that hazard too. Um, we're trying to, we're kind of trying to keep maintain it. We're, we're trying to maintain maintainability, basically. It makes total sense. Okay. It, it did do us was, at the time. <laughs> there was another question from Otto. Yes, um, uh, excellent, Mark, thanks. It uh, looks very promising from uh, my point of view and our point of view. Uh, uh, okay, a couple of questions. Perhaps uh, to, to what extent does uh, the uh, the PE schedule system look beyond uh, beyond its own set of processes and threads with respect to understanding uh, how much resources are available on the server? I mean, do, do they do this PE schedule look into the general load of the server in some sense? No, it doesn't. Um, and All this right. is this is one of those cases where. Um, this is one of those cases where you know people people have a work people give the system a workload, and there's there's sort of there's sort of a line I think that we try not to cross where you know there's there's our application and there's kind of system hygiene where the people who operate it you know need to keep an eye on it and make sure they have enough resources to do the the workload that they're doing. That said, um, right. and we've been for something we've been kicking around for for many years and and haven't done yet for reasons I'll go into in a second. Uh, we've talked about doing resource system resource modeling and figuring out, you know, just how many um, just just how many jobs we can do in parallel. Like, for example, if we had enough enough cores and enough network cards to do, uh, you know, multiple throughputs in parallel, uh, that would be great. But it is a big doing that is a big modeling exercise. And the way people use our system now, we haven't we haven't gotten a lot of complaints that it's a problem. Um, which I think is good. I think people kind of have figured out that, you know, you could put, you could put either a bigger system in place to do more measurement, or for example, as we did at Internet Two, we, we can, you know, the Grace Hopper always used to say that, you know, when you have a bigger problem, you don't get a bigger computer, you get another computer. So we've sort of done that at Internet Two with our separate, uh, our separate person or virtual persona nodes. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't actually we don't actually take a look at what's going on in the system. We assume that if somebody has given us work to do, that we need to be doing it, um, and the the hygiene issues are kind of a system administration problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, second uh, option uh, question. Uh, I guess when you talk about resources, is is memory and and processing resources, uh, but uh, especially when you run fine grained uh, uh, measurements with frequent measurements, uh, also the the buffers in the OS is quite important to well to have them large enough so that you don't get backdrops in the pipeline sort of through the to the, the OS. Olav mentioned this yesterday. Is, is there any chance that the P schedule is uh, taking responsibility for for? I hate I, I, I hate to sound lazy, but no, we don't take responsibility for that either. <laughs> uh, no, and and again, in a lot of ways, that's in a lot of ways that's kind of a that's that's kind of a, a system hygiene and, and tuning thing. Um, if you go to ESnet's faster data site, 
you know, they have a lot of information on, on how to tune for that kind of stuff. Um, okay. But P scheduler itself is really just is, I mean, it is, I kid you not, it is literally just a, um, it's just a platform for managing what measurements get run when. Um, so it's, it is completely unaware, for example, of iper threes requirements to do uh, high bandwidth testing. So that, so things like that require, you know, require tuning the system for it. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say though, if you look at Perf Center as a whole, though, that's kind of where the bundles come in. Like if you just install P-Scheduler, it doesn't touch any system tunings, but if you install like Perf Sonar Toolkit, which pulls down P-Scheduler, it also pulls down some scripts that give some kind of base tunings to the host that it's on. Wow. Um, so that's kind of part of the, the kind of toolkits thing is it kind of sets up the system kind of with an a, you know, initial set of same settings uh, for the type of testing that most people do. So um, yeah. I mean, and the other piece too is you don't, you still want it to essentially look at like, you know, the data transfer nodes and, and things like that. So there's always that balance of overtuning it, right? And then you're not finding the problems that other people are seeing. So, okay. Pro probably what we, yeah, probably what we can add here as well is that, like Mark said, this uh, system administration uh, thing, but. Uh, we recommend using different interfaces, network interfaces, and so allocate different buffers as well too. Uh, and so you can run your very uh, sensitive latency measurement on a dedicated interface and everything else on, on a different one. And so you're, uh, you have, yeah, probably better, uh, better chance that it's this, this latency measurements are not uh, polluted by by over network traffic and buffer overruns. Yeah, and it's certainly. I mean, it's never it's never going to be perfect because you know you have. I mean, if you have iperf running, that's that's kind of a a high load thing, and it, it will have probably some effect on on what you're running in the background. Um, I had this conversation with Matt Zakoskis many years ago, and I think his his take on it was. You know, if the if the latency suffers a little bit, if the latency measurements suffer, if you're, if you're doing continuous latency and it suffers a little bit, and you can still correlate that to having been doing a throughput measurement at the same time, um, it's not so bad because you sort of know why it happened um, versus it being something out on the network. True. Thanks. Thank you, Otto, Pete, um, and even for the questions, uh, any more from the audience? Yeah, if you have time, I have one. Yeah, sure, go ahead, yeah. Olaf. Yeah, I was wondering if, if you know the, this new streaming concept, the, the SLAM concept, if that could be, let's say, applied to other kind of measurements too, so it's be general or would it be just tied to OAMP? Because I, I could think about running continuous trace routes also. Yeah, no, this is this is applicable to any of that. Um, mm -hmm. There's sort of there's there's kind of a limit. There's kind of a limit to how how frequently P scheduler can run a measurement. Um, you know, if if you're going to tell it run individual measurements at one second intervals. That's just not a reasonable thing to do with P-Scheduler because it wasn't designed for that. And that's, you know, that's why we integrated, there, there were a number of architectural things that we did to, uh, to, accommodate, um, to accommodate running uh, oh, uh, uh, PAL stream. So um, all of, those, all of those, those architectural things are available to other tools that can generate uh, continuous, um, uh, continuous results like that. Um, so, you know, continuous trace route. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and pretty much anything else. I mean, if you're taking stock price measurements every three seconds or something like that, that's, that's just as doable. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, will it also cover, uh, will it also cover uh, uh, the use of, um, let's say some kind of backend uh, aggregation facility, you know, behind our uh, uh, detailed reports, you probably want to do some reduction of data because if, if you. Sure. Yeah. Um, the answer to that is we we pass on to the archive whatever the whatever the, the measurement tool um, whatever the measurement tool produces by way of the the, the plugin. So the model is uh, we have you know we the, the the tests and the results are kind of abstract representations and the tool the tool basically takes the takes the test translate to something that the 
the tool plugin translates the, the, the test specification to something that the tool doing the measurement will understand and then translates what comes back into something that fits the kind of abstract P schedule representation. And that gets that gets shipped off to the ARC to whatever archives you have specified. Um, now that said, I, I think I mentioned this to, um, I can't remember if you were still on the call or not when we talked about this, but I did mention this to Otto yesterday. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would be totally reasonable to have a tool that does a lot of measurements and um, you know, either, either does the processing to figure out when there was a problem and says, Here, here's something I detected that was problematic. Um, for example, I think Otto was looking for um, you know, basically for drops in service, uh, which you could do, for example, I'll just I'll take ping as an example because it's really simple. You, know, you could have something that sits there and, and pings something at the other end uh, you know, once a second all day long. And you probably don't need to, you probably don't need to put, unless you, you care what the, what the round trip time was, which is a whole other discussion. But let's say you're just doing up versus down. Um, you could at some point do streaming results where, where the result says, I wasn't able to ping the other end. And I haven't been able to ping the other end from, you know, two o'clock to 205 or something like that. Um, so in that respect, you can sort of do some of the aggregation of the results internally. Um, and that, that will spread a lot of the workload also out to the edges versus having to transport all that stuff to a central place and, and deal with it there. And again, some of, a lot of that just depends on what your, on what your, what your data retention needs are. If you need every measurement, then you need every measurement. You're going to have to pay to transport it. That's just the, that's just the way of it. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Was that the yes or no? <laughs> oh, I, yeah, that was, I, if, what was your original question again? I think I did wander off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Would you facilitate a, a way to analyze the ping so that you could just get the you know uh, down down reports? On oh yeah, that that's something that's something that you would do inside of a tool. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but yeah. It's architecturally, it is it is definitely feasible. Mm -hmm. But okay. but Mark. Um, you know, uh, most likely we are looking at uh, trying to not to, you know, replace, for example, power stream, but be able to use the results of the power stream, you know, the raw data and make some analytical, you know, sure. uh, aggregation out of that before P scheduler is able to, you know, collect the data or, you know, sit between the two and the P scheduler archiver. You know, and and kind right. of transform the data, transform the data, and that would be that would be something that you could probably do. That would be something you would do inside of a tool, if that's what you you basically have to come up with a specialized test and tool for that. But architecturally, you can do it. Yeah, and I think the nice thing about P scheduler is it's really flexible. I can think of a handful of ways to do what we just talked about, right? At different layers, it's really going to depend on the application, like how you want to do it. You could write a wrapper program underneath that does it all for you before it passes to P scheduler. You could pass it through a piece scheduler, sort an archive, or do it at the archiver layer. You could use a different archive plugin and send it to a message bus and do it there. You know, there's a lot of flexibility there, so it's really just going to depend on the, the application and what you're after. So yeah, lots of lots of cats and lots of different ways to skin them. All right. Thank you very much for all these discussions and uh, presentations. Um, we're running a bit over the, the second session, but it, um, it, it, was, it was good uh, discussing all of that. Uh, I guess it's the right time for a short break. Uh, I would suggest to take a 15 minute break and to uh, meet again here in, uh, yeah, in 15 minutes. So at, uh, at 2.10 UTC time, uh, and for the for the final session of this uh, of Sonai user workshop. Yeah, yeah, you can. I guess you can go. You can go ahead in the next one. So we've been discussing this actually uh, a few times already at the workshop last year. Uh, we presented different options for the OS support, and we also collected your feedback to uh, to know and understand better. Uh, what were your preferred uh, operating system of choice? And then uh, at the Persona Day organized by Internet2 last November, we also uh, discussed this a bit more, presented uh, again. And so this is the, the current 
operating systems and architecture we support in Persona, in the current uh, release of Persona 4.4. Um, so we have two versions of Debian and two versions of Ubuntu. Actually, we only have one version of Ubuntu uh, at the moment because Ubuntu 16 has been discontinued by uh, Canonical as well. Uh, and so this, uh, the support for these operating system, these operating systems are, are reaching end of life, and we know that, and uh, we need to support uh, a larger set of of, uh, of our operating system and newer ones uh, in the near future. It was difficult to work on uh, supporting new OS with 4.4 and uh, working on uh, on developing 5.0 at the same time. Uh, because mainly uh, uh, also a, a reason why we're moving away from Mesmond and from Cassandra is that uh, all the, a lot of the libraries and the, the code that we have uh, written and I, I, uh, using so far uh, is not easily portable to the new uh, uh, versions of these, these operating systems. So this is the set of, of of uh, Debian and Ubuntu systems that, that we have now. And you can go next to the next slide, Mark. And this is what we're going to support in 5.0. Uh, so only Debian 10 and both Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu 20, and only a set of four different architectures for, for this, uh, this release. Uh, the other ones, the ones that the two that, that we're dropping uh, are the uh, old processor that probably doesn't have enough uh, power uh, to to run buffs on our P scheduler anyway. Uh, so it's it's not not useful to provide uh, packages for for these um, other architectures. Uh, and what we're probably going to do is to add Debian 11 as well that's uh, that's been uh, uh, released uh, recently in Ubuntu 22. Uh, both have been re released in uh, a, a few months ago, uh, and uh, that will come right after 5.0 when we have time to um, to work a bit more on on all that. So that's what it looks like for the OS support in in Debian and Ubuntu. And I guess the next slide is up for you, Mark. Thanks, Antoine. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about a little later about some of the things that are being done to uh, to improve uh, our support for for other operating systems. Um, so, I, most installations of, of Persona, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is, is is on CentOS because that's primarily what we support for that. Um, and if you haven't been living under a rock for the last year or two, you'd probably you'll probably be aware that um, CentOS, as we know it, is is pretty much done with. Red Hat dropped support for CentOS 8 at the end of 2020, at the end of 2021, uh, despite its original end of life having been scheduled for 2029. What they did with that was they created a replacement called CentOS Stream, um, which is a set of what they call semi-rolling releases that are placed downstream of Fedora, but upstream of the stable enterprise Linux. And that move has been has been kind of roundly criticized, and I think kind of in a, in a justifiable way, as as being kind of the beta stream for enterprise Linux. And and what we heard from a lot of our uh, our users is that they don't want to use it because it's not kind of fully up to production quality yet. So when all this happened, the there was kind of a, a big shift that began in the in the Red Hat derived landscape. We had basically four existing distributions. There was Fedora. Um, Enterprise Linux, CentOS, which was on a, a stable base, as well as um, as well as Oracle. All four of these things had been in general availability for a long time. And the other thing that they had in common was that they were all controlled by corporations. So in the wake of this, um, a bunch of new distributions popped up. CentOS Stream, obviously, um, you know, was what fell out of that. That went to general availability um, last January, but again, um, is um, is 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 controlled by by Red Hat. However, in the in the midst of that, two other distributions popped up: um, Alma Linux and Rocky Linux, both of which are essentially what CentOS used to be, which was a rebuild from the stable enterprise Linux base. Uh, those those went to general availability uh, last year in in uh, in March and June, respectively, 
And both of those are really interesting to us because um, they are they are uh, maintained by sponsored foundations and are a lot less um, a lot less uh, tied to the whims of of Red Hat. Um, and this, as as I as you know, is is kind of a much needed reset, I think, to the way things were um, previously. The uh, the foundations that sponsor both Alma and Rocky um, have drawn a pretty good list of. Uh, of sponsors, um, it's interesting to note that the three heavy hitters in the um, in the cloud computing world all went rocky, and and one of them, uh, Amazon, went both ways and is, is supporting both. And I suppose they probably have good reasons for that. Um, the good news, however, is that feature wise, they're they're pretty much the same. Um, both are are should be 100% bug compatible with uh, Red Hat Enterprise, which is great. Um, the the things on this on this chart were actually a little different the first time I used it, um, which may actually have been at last year's uh, at last year's European person or user group. Um, but things have kind of stabilized. So both are available on Intel and select um, select ARM architectures. Both have EPAL built in. The big thing that's changed since a year ago is that there are both uh, Docker and Vagrant images available officially for those. And the number of mirrors has come up to uh, pretty reasonable parity. So I think either of them, um, Either of them should work just fine. So the future of this, as far as Personar is concerned, um, is that we will have full support for a few things. The first being CentOS 7, and we will continue supporting that until it reaches end of life on June, uh, June 30th, two years from now. Starting in 5.0, we'll start supporting all Linux 8 officially. Um, it has everything in it that CentOS 8 did. It has some minor differences that actually bring it in line with what uh, Red Hat Enterprise is. And I think that is also a much needed reset um, because there were some differences between CentOS and Enterprise that, um, that made supporting both of them difficult. It is, as I, as I mentioned before, it's bug compatible with, uh, with Red Hat Enterprise 8. Uh, we're using it uh, internally at Internet 2 for a number of things. And it kind of looks, smells, and tastes just like, uh, just like the original. Uh, this will also be our initial primary development environment. We're, we're simply shifting to that from CentOS 7, which, which was kind of where we were doing most of our development before. Additionally, we will support either with or after uh, 5.0, we will support officially Rocky Linux 8. Uh, it also is bug compatible with Enterprise 8. Uh, the, uh, the, the small amount of experimentation that I've done with it um, have have shown that it runs the the RPMs that I've built on Alma with no problem. So I don't anticipate that that the choice between one or the other will cause any heartburn. Um, and if there are any differences, we'll get them ironed out. They should be they should be fairly small. Something else we're going to have is what's called advisory support. And that will be for for two distributions: Oracle Linux and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And what advisory support means is that if we're we're advised it works, we'll mention it. Um, but it will not be something that's officially supported by the project. Now, because Alma and Rocky are bug compatible with Red Hat Enterprise, we anticipate that Red Hat Enterprise should run the RPMs that we produce, no problem. So if your shop uses that, that's fine. Um, you know, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Um, community involvement on that front is welcome. So if you, if you happen to be an Oracle shop or an, a Red Hat Enterprise shop, um, we, we definitely love your involvement just so we can we can get as, as many things as, as we can support it because despite the despite the, the bumpiness of what's happened with Red Hat over the last couple of years, um, we want this thing to run on as many as many things as we can accommodate within reason. Um, and on that front, we will also take uh, patches that don't break supported distributions and integrate them so that they get uh, they can they can be built on the the other distributions if uh, if necessary. That might not be something we do, but we and, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. But we're we're doing some things to make our build infrastructure a little better that might facilitate uh, people outside the project building it. There are two things that will not be supported. What they are should probably be fairly obvious by now. Um, one is CentOS 8, which of course is now past its end of life and not supported anywhere. Uh, and the second will be CentOS Stream. Uh, we may use that internally to accelerate support for new releases. Uh, fortunately, Alma 9 is, is now officially in beta, so we have something that's fairly close to what, uh, what it should look like when it gets released, and we will be taking a hard look at that after we get 5.0 out the door. Um, finally, just a couple of, of kind of, um, kind of catch-all catch notes here. 
we are making some efforts internally to support um, to support operating systems a little better than we have. In some ways, especially as as far as like CentOS eight was concerned, uh, we've kind of been deficient in in getting to support for that out in time. And and a lot of it is again a side effect of just being a big project with a small staff. Um, one of the things that we have done is we've made Debian and Ubuntu uh, first class development environments relative to the Red Hat derived stuff. And we did that largely because um, at the time we made the decision to do that, we had no idea whether or not Alma and Rocky were going to be viable. Fortunately, it turned out that they, that they are, so it's not going um, to upset our Apple cards too much. One other thing that we have going on internally is something we've developed called Unibuild. Um, and Unibuild does the, the work of getting packages built for enterprise Linux and Debian derived platforms and potentially others should we decide to support them. Uh, but it does it in a very consistent way um, and will make, uh, will make building these things a lot easier. And we'll simplify our, our Jenkins environment and, and a few other things. This was originally built for pscheduler, which is sort of the poster child for having to build packages because pscheduler at the moment is about 130 packages. Um, but we are in the midst, and Andy talked about this before, we are in the midst of incorporating it through the rest of the project. Um, the initial beta release will be will be done on our old build system, and we're kind of hoping to get everything um, kind of unibuilt before all this stuff is over, and that, would, that will simplify our lives considerably. Additionally, I'm sure many of you are aware that we run a test bed with our, our nightlies and our, uh, our, our beta things that we're, you know, we're, we're preparing to, to release. Uh, we have pretty good coverage. We have good coverage for CentOS 7. Uh, we are looking for anyone that has some resources or, or that runs either Alma 8 or Rocky 8 or Debian on any of the more exotic architectures. We'd like to have some more some more coverage with that. Uh, the commitment for the commitment for joining the help the, the test bed is relatively small. It's anywhere from two to eight VMs, depending on how much of this you want to run. Uh, the recommended uh, the recommended configuration is fairly close to our. To what we recommend for uh, you know for for uh, bare metal systems, which is four cores and four gigs of, of memory and forty gigs of disk and, and a single IP a piece. That's what we're running at Internet Two, and it's been a good size. We do have some infrastructure to run under uh, run all the stuff under Vagrant on bare metal. It's very it's very enterprise Linux centric right now, um, and we'll probably switch that to using Ansible. We'll kind of eat our own uh, eat our own dog food that we've developed for for doing the builds. So that we have better support for Debian. It's also VirtualBox centric, but we may also be able to switch that to uh, to, to LiveVirt if we need to support other things. Um, so that's pretty much all I have on that. If you have questions or anything else, um, I'll be more than happy to field them. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Or Antoine, either if it's Debian related. Yep. Any question? To related to the operating system support? I guess the, the flip side of that question is, does anyone have any concerns with what they've heard? Silence will be taken as content. Yeah, Tim, this is also not the first time we've discussed this in public. No, 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 here, so, well, no I mean, there so we've, I mean, we've, we've certainly that, gotten some feedback though, so. Yeah, yeah. No, there's been extensive solicitation of comments, but there may be some new people here that aren't familiar with the choice and why. I have to say it did cause us a lot of heartburn, but I think things are, I think things will shake out nicely. All yeah, right. Uh, well, if we don't hear any question or comment, uh, we can uh, go to the uh, to the next presentation, with, which is a presentation from Andy um, about the, the Persona roadmap after 5.0. All right, let me get things fired up. Um, so let's see, so I'm Andy, I'm back again um, as well. <laughs> a little bit more space between last time uh, than the Mark had, but... Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's coming kind of after 5.0. Um, but before I do that, just to kind of get into some of the, the why we're going to be looking at the things that we're looking at. Um, let's bring back some versions of, of, you know, one of my favorite diagrams, just to throw, show, throw on these slides um, uh, again. 
Uh, so, you know, Persona over the past, you know, number of years has kind of evolved its, its architecture over time. So if we look, you know, back, so it's just going back beyond like five years ago, um, this was kind of the 3.x architecture in particular. I think this might even be specific to like 3.5 or whatever the, the last one was, because some of this stuff did not exist when, when Persona 3.0 came out. Um, uh, but, but basically, you know, we had the BWTL and kind of regular testing and, and, and kind of the scheduling layer. Um, there, there were iterations even pre, you know, the, this last version of, of the archiving and stuff too. This is, um, but, but kind of really just looking here, you know, when we went to 4.0 is when we kind of ripped that out and we really kind of had a focus on the, the scheduling layer, which allowed us then to add a lot more options kind of in this tools layer. You, you can see here it got a little bit bigger, but we've never really captured the full set of plugins that PCO3 supports. Um, we added kind of some central configuration stuff to allow kind of that setup to be easier. Um, and we got some, you know, initial, um, you know, we got some more options here in the archiving, um, which, you know, led into the 5.0. Um, and so then 5.0, you know, we kind of leveraged that flexibility here. And then the idea is hopefully we can do some similar things up in this visualization layer that we did down the tools layer before. It kind of relates to a question, I think, Tim asked yesterday about, is there any documentation about adding a new test and going all the way from collecting the measurement to the visualization? And I think kind of, we have some documentation about how to get to like about this level right here. Um, but I think kind of 5.0, we're hoping to essentially solve that last mile, right? To get up to the visualization layer easier. Um, it's possible before it just took more work, right? So we're hoping this will kind of make things a little bit more cookie cutter. Uh, in terms of, you know, you just drop it into to open search, there's uh, Grafana plugins and Kibana plugins, and you can just, if it's a new data type, those new fields are available and, and you just, you just grab them. So um, that, that was kind of the thought with 5.0. Uh, so looking kind of beyond 5.0, um, we want to build in, kind of uh, build on a lot of these concepts. Uh, and some of the stuff I talk about should look familiar because we've already touched on um, some of it you know, just naturally through some of the presentations, uh, both today and yesterday. Um, and so similar to, to Mark here, uh, it's always good to put in the disclaimer when talking about uh, future stuff that, that all of this stuff is uh, subject to change um, and, and, and kind of as we go through our planning process and, and things like that. Um, so as we look at kind of going forward, there's a few common themes, right? So we've kind of been working our way up, up that kind of stack. Um, uh, for the past few major releases now. So I think there'll be a lot of focus on front end and, and kind of those top level services that build on kind of the new ar archiving infrastructure and, and things like that, that we have available. Um, and, you know, there'll also be kind of a theme of, we've, a lot of those components have expanded too, as, as we've gone from 3.x to, to, to 5.x over, over the many years. Um, and so there's been a couple places, you know, we've tried to be consistent, but there's been a couple places where maybe there's been divergences in programming languages or, or things like that, right, that it'd be good to bring back together just, just for kind of support. Um, and then kind of the last thing, which is really more kind of internal to the development team, but I think important nonetheless is um, we want to get some better coverage on, on cross training, you know, if, uh, you know, Mark gets hit by a bus or, you know, wins the lottery, sorry, that, that's the nicer version. Right, we want to be able to, to to still support P scheduler, so um, uh, and things like that. So so that that'll be an important theme, and I think kind of as we work on things and and kind of consolidate the stack, this is a good chance to kind of get some new people to to touch the various components and, and kind of become more familiar with them. So let's look at a few items. So I think one of the, the big things uh, that we'll be doing is we have a, a UI called the PS Config Web Admin or PWA. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here have actually used it before, um, but it's uh, an interface to basically build the PS config kind of central configurations and it talks to the lookup service so it can do autocomplete and stuff like that. And you know, basically it saves you from having to generate some JSON by hand um, and, and allow you to kind of use a visual tool to build those configurations. Um, and it's a, it's a really useful tool, but uh, just, you know, for essentially for historical purposes, um, uh, it was kind of inherited from an external uh, a project uh, that was nice enough to do some of the work on it, but, but it's using basically a tech stack that's not like anything else we have, which means it pulls in additional dependencies for people uh, and things like that. The, the biggest of which is, is MongoDB. 
um, which very similar to what we went through with Elasticsearch and had to kind of pivot to, to open search. It, it actually is the originator of the SSPL, the server side public license, right? So we're actually kind of pinned to a version before that change. Um, uh, and, and so we kind of want to be free with that. Um, so uh, basically one of the, the developers at IU, John uh, Gregudis, is, is actually working on a, a redesign for that. Um, and we'll be mark, uh, basically be looking at moving that back end more in line with like uh, whatever other things such as pscopes are used, which is Postgres. Um, we also want to kind of address some of the, the longstanding features of, uh, you know, we want the, all the flexibility we have in like psconfig and pscopes to really kind of come out in the UI. We don't have to have to do a new code release every time someone adds a new test or archiver plugin. Uh, and things like that. So, so that's the type of thing we'll be looking at and, and just generally a, a UI refresh. And again, there's some JavaScript libraries and things like that that are kind of out of sync with, with other stuff that we do. Um, so, so this, this will be a, a kind of a big piece of, of what we'll be looking at beyond 5.0. And then, in fact, I've already started looking at it. Um, I don't need to talk about this one too much. Mark, I think, covered it pretty well in his presentation, but I thought I'd mention it here anyways. Is kind of looking at cleaning up OAMP. We haven't touched it in a while. There's a lot of things that are not optimal about it now and, and can cause problems for, for people with our large kind of test infrastructures, right? So, so we're going to be looking at cleaning that up. And as I said, basically see Mark's earlier talk uh, for details on that. Um, and so then we'll also be doing some work on the lookup service side of things. Uh, so you already saw some of that earlier today uh, with the improved reporting UI in Grafana. Um, but then we want to be able to kind of take that uh, even a step further. Uh, so one thing we've always wanted in the lookup service is it, it, right now it just shows you basically the current moment in time, what the, all the deployments and things look like. But we haven't really done like a time series and tracked that as it's changed like historically. Um, so we'd like to update that, right, and actually keep the snapshots uh, over time. And that way we can do things like, well, um, you know, is there a change in operating system support, right? Like, you know, we can see the trends and things like that for, for what people are running or, or, or whatever, right? Um, so it's, it'll be useful to be able to do that. Um, and then another thing uh, will be kind of better data typing. Pretty much everything is a string in the lookup service now, um, but actually, you know, actually having the locations be a geo point and, uh, uh, you know, actually mapping IP addresses to IP address types will allow for, for some uh, better searching and, and things like that. Uh, so, so those will be some things we're looking at at the lookup server side of the house. Uh, so I think another biggie is uh, replacing like the Mad Dash infrastructure with, with something um, likely built on, on Grafana, um, just because again, less kind of code for us to maintain. Um, and I think generally, so, so one thing uh, we have a developer working on at ESNet uh, is a Grafana plugin. Uh, that we're calling the adjacency matrix, which looks, uh, that, that's actually a screenshot of it working with some test data uh, that the developer shared with, uh, a week or so to, ago with me. Um, uh, that basically you'll just be able to drop in, into Grafana and, and point at your persona data is, is the idea. Um, the plugin itself should also generally be useful for non-persona data um, as well. Uh, and then also, you know, being in, in one of these visualization systems, we won't just be limited to this grid. We can also do all the other cool stuff you can do with the systems like Grafana and use different visualizations and graphs and, and things like that. Um, and then I think one of the last things, again, kind of more on the internal front is in kind of on that theme of technology consolidation is uh, uh, eliminating kind of the remaining Perl components. We, we still have a few pieces that are written in Perl. Uh, so I listed a, uh, um, various ones there, um, you know, just basically Perl has, has essentially kind of fallen out of favor over the years. It's increasingly difficult to find developers, uh, especially if you, you know, you're talking younger developers uh, that are familiar with Perl uh, and things like that. Um, so we'll, in general, we'll probably move that stuff just, you know, to things like Python to be consistent with what we have. Again, kind of going for consistency there. Um, uh, so, so we can kind of get the most coverage in terms of people that can, can support it. And, and things like that. And that, that's really all I had. Um, again, you know, we're kind of got our heads down mostly on, on 5.0 at this point. We do have a few people off kind of working on or starting these, these various efforts here. Um, and, and so, yeah, again, all of this is probably subject to change, but uh, these, are, these are some things we're already starting to look at or, or planning to look at in, in the very near future. So that's it.
So I guess any questions, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for this presentation. Any question related to the roadmap or to the future development? Uh, I just want to compliment you for, for taking such a good grip at the architecture and, and strategy. So it, it looks, looks good to me. So, and uh, so the, the foils are fine and uh, uh, let's see if it uh, <laughs> makes it, but uh, I guess it would, mm, yes. Just wanted to mention about the COVID comment there. It was uh, like, you know, uh, you know, when Andy was talking about the uh, tracking of the number of deployments and, you know, the footprint is something like, uh, you know, something similar, you know, to see how, uh, you know, global things change and uh, impact the deployments, I guess, something in the sort. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, being able to. Uh to see global impacts. I know, you know, the events in Ukraine too have been a, a common theme. Yes, yes, also, yeah, yeah. I don't know that persona nodes are the number one thing people are worried about, but you know, that's Still, the type of information yeah. Not available, yeah, so. Yes, I like your comment, Mark, so. <laughs> So is there any other question or comment uh, general to, the, to the, the workshop, to any presentation we had uh, today or yesterday? Uh, we have some, uh, some spare time, a bit of spare time now, so we can address any other question you have. So I see that question in chat. I can take that. I know it's probably not uh, necessarily directed at me, but um, so we still don't necessarily recommend VMs, uh, as you see in like the lookup service stats, not, uh, not necessarily everyone listens to us <laughs> in that respect. Um, you still have, you know, similar kind of drifting issues and things with that, like that potentially, um, you know, another way to look at it though, is if VM is essentially your only choice, which for some people it is, you know, you could argue it's better than nothing. <laughs> um, you're at least getting some information, um, or, you know, maybe you're testing, uh, you have VM infrastructure that you're testing and, or you don't care as much about the latency. Um, but I don't think the situation has really changed that much. Um, you know, one thing that has changed over the years is the availability of containers. And those are a little bit different story in, in general in our testing. Um, they're close enough to the hardware that you don't actually have the same concerns that you have with VMs, which, which has been interesting. Um, and I think part of the reason people like uh, Internet2 especially are, are kind of, um, playing with with deployments uh, in, in those types of environments so yeah I, I would add that i mean vms i think depending on the depending on the app on, on what you're measuring there there are certainly places where vms would do just fine um but it's i mean it's pretty plain that like you know the high performance measurement applications those do best on bare metal or um as as we found at internet too that you know they're the the loss in performance from dropping down into a container is, is almost negligible. Um, and I don't know, Andy, you'd probably know this better than I do. I don't know whether we count containers as VMs or if we count those separately. Um, no, I, I mean, we, do, we don't, yeah. Oh, okay, so that's- Unless you're running on a, like a Mac, because then it is, but- Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it is a VM. But um, yeah, no, no, we don't. And I know too, like Ryan Tierney years, a few years ago did the, you know, probably similar testing you guys and found the same thing. It's like the containers negligible, you know, just- yeah. Yeah. Brian, Brian actually helped us do a lot of the tuning on our okay. containers. So that doesn't surprise me. Yep. Oh, I guess I also would add to the, the time drift problem causing negative latency. That's more a, that's more a clock discipline problem versus, um, uh, you know, versus, um, something that's, that's VM or, um, uh, or, or, bare metal specific, um, especially in, in really short, if you're trying to measure short um, uh, latency over short distances, the, the clock discipline that we get out of NTP or crony is just not good enough um, to measure those. Um, and I know there's been some interest, I think University of Michigan has, has discussed developing tools that, that would use say PTP 
uh, where the, the packets are actually tagged, time tagged as they go out. I mean, all that's, none of that has happened yet, but it, it is something that's been kicked around and it is something that's, that's doable. Um, and I think we talked about PTP a little bit yesterday and I think it's become a lot more practical. So I think as there's interest and people start developing latency tools, then, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to integrate them. Yeah, I guess latency, the accuracy of latency depends on the use case you have. If you're measuring from, um, I don't know, the UK to, uh, I don't know, Washington, hypothetically, then, um, you know, the odd millisecond here or there is not a big deal. If you're doing it across campus, then, or within a data center or something like that, then it becomes. Yeah, that's huge. More important. Um, but I don't think that, yeah, I think the accuracy would still be the same if you're using the same method to sync your clocks, but it's just that the, the relative amount of that inaccuracy is, is less important. I tried telling people that we had we had developed time travel technology that would let the packets arrive before they departed, but nobody bought it. Uh, I actually, I found that uh, NTP, uh, if you configure that uh, with, with a higher pole frequency, uh, the accuracy of NTP can improve uh, by a factor of 10 from the standard setup. So you could actually get down to to uh, a half half a millisecond now in uh, stability or accuracy, so, so it's, you could do something in, in that uh, era if you. I think I think that's probably a fair comment. But if you, I mean, if you just look at the persona data we get, for example, the WRCG tests we do across the UK, you will see whether you compare the the latency measurements in both directions, um, and they they are within a millisecond or so of of each other and it's not that dissimilar if you go across to sites in the US from the UK um, so I think NTP is I think it gets a bad rap because if you if you deploy it badly if you choose a bad set of NTP servers if you've got congestion on the link if there's jitter if it's an asymmetric path there's a whole bunch of reasons why it might go wrong um, but if you're in a well configured network on you know on generously provisioned network on with good servers and a good configuration you should be able to get within a millisecond or so I would say um, yeah. But absolutely, I love if you you know if you do the sort of things you're suggesting that yeah you know, if you poll more frequency then more frequency more frequently that that can't hurt well, unless it becomes an NTP DOS attack of course that's another story <laughs> and and NTP I mean NTP can do well but the problem is is that you know it, if somebody says well yeah we're using NTP you kind of have to dig a little deeper and find out how they're using NTP um, you know yeah is, I mean yeah. In a way, Mark, you're lucky that you're in a big country with a high latency across most of it. Whereas if you're in a little island <laughs> with like five milliseconds or so across your network, then it's um, you're more sensitive to it. And obviously, if you're in a campus or a data center, even, even more so. Yeah, well, and it's interesting for me, too, because I live, I kid you not, I am spitting distance from Ashburn. So most of the services that I get, you know, my Netflix, my Amazon, all that kind of stuff are all you know, those are all very close and I benefit from mm. the, from the low latency and that, but um, yeah, you're right. It's, it, it, you know, I mean, I, I, a lot of this stuff, I think if you're going to experiment with it, you probably do it in the lab and you can induce latency to, um, you know, to kind of exercise that. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's, it's all just a question of how well you discipline the clocks, yeah. um, you know, which I think if, if you need, I mean, even a half a millisecond, you know, at fiber speeds is still quite a bit of distance. Um, yeah. and, um, you know, I think that's probably where, where applications for PTP will become better. Cause that's, that's pretty well tagged. If you have a good, uh, mm. if you have a good reference, but I think, yeah, I think I completely agree. And I think there's maybe a, a strand of work to be started up in exploring that further updating the PTP statement on the first sonar site, for example, which I think we agree is maybe five years old now, and maybe could be, um, more practical with today's world, but I'm aware of a number of NRENs that are exploring deploying a PTP service, but we need to, I guess, understand who are the persona users who are currently bothered by the, um, the level of accuracy they get from NTP, where are the use cases where it matters to them. Um, that's the question. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're sort of, as a project, we're sort of in a, I don't want to call it a weird spot, but you know, in a lot of cases, we're sort of a big, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of ways we're at least as P scheduler goes, we're kind of a big integration effort. You know, so if there are if if there are tools that exist that do that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. great. You know, iperf, iperf two, iperf three, 
uh, ether, you know, all those things were, were written elsewhere and we integrate them. Um, and there, I think there are a lot of tools that, that, um, that need to be developed that we just don't have the horsepower to do. Mm. Um, you know, so if somebody, if somebody comes up with it, with a latency tool that uses PTP, great, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of 90% of the effort and the rest is just, we write some plugins to make it work. Yeah. Well, obviously if one of the consortium members decided it's a priority for them and want to do that, then right. great. I, uh, a sort of related question. I can't see him scanning around the video. Um, I mean, Ed talked yesterday about, yesterday about using um, Persona to do campus-based measurements. I just wonder whether um, latency was an issue there in any way, um, or accuracy or inaccuracy of latency for those measurements. Yeah, it is. It's a uh... We have the time travel problem and the clock discipline mm. problem and it being spread across campus with different management. It's real hard to get consistent clock discipline. Mm. Um, I wanted to solve this using PTP. I had a lot of different conversations at the institution level for me. And then uh, I talked to some people involved in some broader efforts. And it just seemed like the infrastructure to do PTP wasn't going to realistically emerge in the uh, time frame that I had hoped. So we're just basically using latency right now as uh, a red light, green light situation. If you're, mm -hmm. you know, if you're getting some crazy latency, like seconds or something, that's red. And on campus, if you get, if you time travel or if you are, within so many milliseconds, you're green. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, obviously when you're coming at this from the perspective of more of like an ISP, you know, your, your uh, margin of error is smaller than the natural latency due to distances involved and it works just fine. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I hear this optimism that PTP infrastructure is going to emerge you know, and in a more timely fashion at the moment, but I, having had the experiences that I've had, I don't share that optimism. So, <laughs> I think, we'll yeah, I mean, the problem there is that, I mean, the problem there is that you know, edge switches, edge devices may only get refreshed every 10 years or, you know, the, the, the frequency at which you do your edge is much less than your core in terms of upgrades. Um, so if you need support yeah, well, on the switch devices, it's an issue, presumably. I don't think you need PTP support fully end to end, though, do you? But if the, the more no, devices that no, understand it, the better. No, okay. you don't. You don't necessarily need it end to end if you do round trip mark. Because oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, because you can do it. Yeah. If yeah, you do round, yeah, round trip. Round trip is, is compared to your own clock, and that's a lot less likely to do. Yeah, break. exactly. But, but like, one one way you have to have two clocks that are in good sync, or it's just not going to work. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt this, this discussion because we're getting near the end of the, the workshop mm -hmm. time. And uh, I know there is, we have some limitation on the time for the recording of the, the session, uh, but we can uh, just do a formal uh, wrap up of the, of the, the workshop uh, with, uh, I know Ivana has uh, something presented and then uh, follow up with some informal discussion if you want to continue discuss on that uh, after the recording is, is, is ended. Yeah, so I'll hand over to Ivana for the conclusion of the workshop. Uh, thank you, Antoine. So just a few slides to summarize what we had these last few days. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation. Yeah, we, we can see that, thank you. Excellent, thank you. So um, during these last two days, uh, we had the 16 presentations from 11 organizations. We had uh, 57 registered attendees and uh, 40, uh, 55 of them participated, which is actually an excellent uh, uh, turnout comparing with some other uh, events. Uh, and uh, all the presentations and recordings will be made available. I know that Antoine will share the link. It will be on the, on the wiki page. Actually, the link is already shared um, 
in the uh, chat of the Zoom. Uh, so um, uh, we had uh, uh, two different approaches in our presentations. Uh, the first day was uh, from uh, our users uh, and uh, from individual implementations. And the second day was mostly from our developers team. Uh, so um, uh, we received, or at least I managed to uh, track down only two <laughs> stronger recommendations. Uh, one was uh, to take uh, uh, special uh, uh, care of uh, our graphical user interface that is being developed uh, for on-demand measurements uh, uh, to uh, make sure that the usage of uh, this is controlled and uh, that uh, the measurements uh, are controlled in a way that it does not not uh, allow some misuse, particularly when running throughput tests in a network. And uh, a comment uh, that came from Tim, uh, who is always strongly supporting uh, symmetry of IPv6. I've never mentioned IPv6 oh. before. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. It is good to have actually always this uh, uh, awareness of, of the importance um, and particularly for, for the future work. So if there is anything else that is missing, uh, please let us know and we would be happy to include it in uh, this list of uh, future recommendations. There were a lot of interesting discussions, uh, but uh, they all ended either with, yes, this is already planned or included, or uh, uh, this is something that uh, does not actually change the architecture and the solution that is proposed. So this is why it was not included in this slide. So uh, uh, just for all of you, a brief recap, uh, although you already know these things, uh, important links uh, where the documentation and the code is, and of course, uh, uh, mailing lists where you can contact the development team. Uh, there is only one uh, presentation that will happen relatively soon. Uh, it is at the TNC conference, which will be in Trieste in Italy in uh, uh, the second week of June. Sorry. Oops. Uh, and uh, this will be a lightning talk uh, from Antoine uh, uh, to recap 20 years of persona and particularly uh, what is uh, uh, being uh, prepared for the 5.0 uh, release, which we actually, most of this uh, we heard in today's presentation. And uh, uh, on behalf of our organization committee, uh, which is um, Antoine, who did the most of the work. Thanks, Antoine, but also Tim, uh, Shimon, Pavel, and myself. We'd really like to thank to all presenters uh, that uh, we heard yesterday. And uh, today, these are just the presenters that are not from the organization committee, but of course, we also have Antoine and Shimon uh, who also presented. And also to all of you who joined uh, uh, our meetings yesterday and today, and we really hope that it was useful and that you would like to see such events in the future. So in order to get the input from you, we would like to ask you to fill in the survey. I will also copy the link in the chat. Uh, there are just a few questions, but uh, basically we are asking what you liked, what you didn't like, what you would like to continue us uh, doing, uh, how often, etc. So we would really appreciate to get the feedback from you. And many thanks in advance. And this is all from my side for today. Many thanks all for joining. Yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, these conclusions, uh, Ivana. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, um, I guess uh, we can wrap up and close this, this uh, officially close this uh, third uh, European user workshop.